Good evening. Thank you. Welcome to our regularly scheduled meeting, the Town Council Weathersfield, Monday, August 21st. Uh, Jody, if you could lead us. Here. Councilor Hurley. Here. Councilor Latina. Here. Councilor Martino. Here. Councilor Rao. Here. Councilor Spinella. Here. Deputy Mayor Barry. Here. And Mayor Montanari. Here. Thank, Thank you, you, Dolores. Jeff has one item before we start. Yeah, I'd like uh, 4B and 4C to come off the agenda. We've got some uh, technical um, matters to work out on those two items, so we'd ask that those two be removed from the agenda this evening. Uh, should we make make a motion to table or just uh, change? Just take it off. Yeah, okay. We'll bring it back when it's ready. You got it, Dolores. Okay, good. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Jeff. Okay. Um, our first item before public comment is uh, we've asked our representatives from the state to attend a discussion with us this evening. I know Paul and Tony and Russ are here. I assume John will join us at some point. So. I'll speak. <laughs> well, we, there you are. <laughs> John's here. Okay, um, Tony's going to just uh, intro it if you could. Thank you. Okay, on behalf of the council, I thank the state delegation for accepting our invitation to attend tonight's council meeting. As chairman of our budget and finance committee, I, along with the members of council, are very anxiously awaiting the passage of a state budget. As you know, in May, we elected to honor our charter requirement and pass a budget with certain unknowns still looming. This was influenced by some extent the delegation's communication with us at that time. That while not definitive, gave some assurances that the various impacts yet to be determined would be worked out and municipal support would remain a priority. The continued limbo together with very devastating proposals coming out of the governor's office are, are of grave concern to our town. Obviously, Wethersfield, like most of the other over 100 towns, who were delivered the proposals last week cannot absorb such massive hits to our educational system. Our superintendent of schools has expressed alarm at the fact our school system is about to open and these proposed devastate, devastations cannot be responded to in a quick enough fashion. And any thought that the town can simply pass these reductions through a tax increase is absurd and dead before it starts. We rely on our delegation to fight, of course, for our town, and we know you will. But the time is fast approaching. We need answers. Let us remember what President John F. Kennedy said. Let us not seek the Republican answer or the Democratic answer, but the right answer. Let us not seek to fix blame for the past. Let us accept our own responsibility for the future. You need to look at mandates. The state funds them and then stops funding when you fall into financial need. The towns cannot continue to fund these mandates. If you cannot fund them, please eliminate, eliminate them. It affects our bottom line. We anxiously await your commentary this evening. Thank you. Thanks, Tony. So um, I don't know if you want to do anything in order, Russ, or do you just want to make some comments and questions? What's, the floor is yours. Yeah, if you could, at the, so we have it on our mic. That'd be great. Thank you. Maybe wants us to make introductory to each of us, maybe? Whatever works for you, that'd be great. Thank you. Uh, let me just start off. Right. Uh, good evening, everyone. I'm Representative Tony Guerrero of the 29th District, which is all of Rock Hill, part of Wethersfield, and part of Newington. John Fon Ferris, State Senator, representing Wethersfield and Hartford. I think you all know who I am. I said hello to all of you before. Russ Moore, 28th District, most of Wethersfield. Um, I think uh, for my, my take, uh, we'll, I'll certainly defer. And if you have questions, I'll, I'll do my best to, to give answers. I think all of us will go in uh, and chime in where, where it's necessary. We look forward to the dialogue. And I'm Paul Doyle, State Senator. Some of you know me, maybe by now most. Um, I'll just comment briefly on the... Um, 
I'll go directly on one of the points the governor's release on Friday. I personally really didn't impact me much. Unfortunately, it impacted the public quite a deal. But all of us have had the pressure of trying to achieve a budget over the past several months. Ideally, we would have achieved it in June. I like to say all of our decisions, whether it's the Democrats, Republicans, whether we come together and have a bipartisan budget or not, all the, the, all the decisions are very difficult, and we're going to have to come to a consensus on them. So whatever the decisions are, no one's going to like them. And that's really what, where we're at. We are struggling trying to achieve consensus on very difficult times. Years ago, things were different. It was much easier. But today, we are struggling with making these difficult decisions. I think we're somewhat closer than we were a month ago. But the fact that the governor released that, to me, is it, it's his opinion that's pressure. Whenever a budget is achieved, those numbers will be reversed. So yes, they're horrific. Yes, I got a lot of calls, and I'm sure my colleagues got a lot of calls saying, ECS is zeroed out, that's the end of it. Well, that's not the case from my perspective. We're all working hard at the Capitol, despite what you may read in the paper. And we um, will eventually make a budget. I'm not going to tell you when, but whenever we achieve the budget, whether it's September, October, even November, those numbers will not stand. Things will be changed. Will they be perfect? No, but they will not be zero. And, um, and, and, and I just, it's unfortunate that the public has taken it as, you know, basically, it's going to be, everything will be zeroed out. And uh, we all, both parties, are struggling trying to achieve consensus. We will do it, and I just don't know exactly when. Thank you. I just want to add a little uh, light to the conversation here in regards to it. This is a whole different session that I've ever seen in my whole tenure of 18 years of, of being a legislator. Um, as many of you know, the Senate is tied 18-18. The House is 76-72, which fo four votes would carry uh, a no pass or give the other side a victory, whatever way you want to look at it. And that is the problem that we're having today, to be quite honest with you. All right, we have budgets out there, but we don't have consensus in chambers or even with the governor, whether it be the Senate, the House, or even the governor. So therefore, you may have some members that may want a sales tax increase, but you may have members of that caucus that say, I will not vote for a sales tax increase, but you need 76 to pass a budget. And in the Senate, it can go the same way, with, with Nancy Wyman being a tie vote, and with the governor saying whether he'll sign a budget or not sign a budget. He's already, always, as you know, said that he's not looking at any type of tax increase. Now, I can't speak for him, but those were the conversations that we heard two months ago. Now, things have changed, and obviously we're meeting uh, on a weekly basis, and I would probably have to say to the people who are watching today, this council meeting, Senator Fonfair is probably meeting on a daily basis, being the uh, chairman of the Finance Committee on the Senate side. But we are in there weekly with caucuses and finding out what's going on here. But if you want to know what's truly going on here, this is the problem that we're having. All right, there's a census out there that doesn't want to see increases in taxes, and there's another census out there that obviously says a slight tax increase to maintain nonprofits and so forth and municipal aid and all that is the time to do that. But we need the votes to do that. In our chambers, we used to have a, a pretty significant amount of a leadway. We don't have that anymore. And in the Senate, it was the same way. As you know, it's 1818. So that is the issues that we are struggling with. It doesn't help you. I understand that. But these are the issues that we're hearing from our constituents, the people that elected us, saying that whether we want a tax increase, no tax increase, and these are the caucuses that we're having, and very you know, difficult caucuses that, you know, you know our, our tempers are, are being um, challenged many a times up there. Um, but we know that, you know, within the next coming months, I'm, I feel confident by the end of October that we should have a budget in place. Um, is it something that we're all going to like? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. So I just want to, I, I hope we all understand that. But if we want to know the truth, that is what's going on right now. So um, what Tony said is absolutely correct. Um, think of it in this chamber. If there were, instead of 6-3, it were, um, if, if it were an even split, between you, um, what that would mean. Um, probably pretty difficult to get things done even when it's 6-3, but uh, never mind if it were an equal number, which it can't be here, but if it were. Um, but beyond that, 
the fiscal side of the of the matter so you have the sheer numbers problem but then you have the fiscal side of it which is uh, substantially reduced revenues particularly with respect to the income tax and estimates and finals which is in layman's terms capital gains substantial underperformance in that area um, and we rely quite heavily on that particularly in Fairfield County um, um, wealth and that's a very erratic revenue stream they have good years and they have bad years they're still millionaires when they're in bad years but we get hurt substantially in terms of how much we rely on that and this year whether it's because people believe that um, the new administration would lead to tax reform and they would benefit they held on to their capital gains who knows what the real reason is that's a lot of speculation but the result is Connecticut and many other states who rely on this particular portion uh, of, of earners um, and and the revenue in their those states are facing similar challenges as we are we probably more than most because we have made our income tax so progressive which a lot of people wanted uh, and fair for sake of fairness and but with that comes this erratic revenue stream that we budget for we will hopefully change that in this coming session there is a proposal before the legislature um, that we're working on which would segregate off uh, the most volatile portion of our income tax and put that immediately towards debt and, and a budget reserve the budget reserve fund so we can begin to get uh, some of the debt behind us um, but in addition to revenues you have fixed costs because Connecticut failed for many years to pay attention to its obligations as it relates to state employees um, and teachers in terms of those pen their pensions and that those chickens are, have come home to roost. And I don't want to get political here. This is not a time to be political. But in fairness, under Governor Malloy, we have, with his leadership and the support of the legislature, we have funded not only the what is called the normal cost, which is the current cost of state employees, health care, teachers, uh, retirement, et cetera, <laughs> but also um, what was projected in terms of their rearage. But we're so far behind. And it keeps eating into more and more of our expenditures. Right now, it's somewhere around 55% of our expenditures goes towards fixed costs. That's not running government in the normal sense of agencies, town funding, et cetera. It's squeezing more and more of our budget, making these challenges even more difficult. In a good year, they're difficult. Now you layer over the fact that we our revenues decline dramatically because of the Trump effect or whatever you want to call it, it's created a great squeeze. And then you bring in the fact that you have 18, 18 in the Senate and a very tight margin in the House. Hey, the fact of the matter is when people have their vote, in past years, people could vote no and the budget would pass. They could exercise their opposition to the budget and it would still pass. That's not happening this year nor next year. So that sets the stage, hopefully, to understand our challenge. I'll just say one more thing. The reality is the governor feels very strongly that towns participate in this problem this year, whereas previously, for many years, through the major recession and beyond, we have protected towns. And, and that's a reality, whether you agree with him or you don't agree with him, and I suspect I know where most people are on that here, but that's a reality. We have protected towns when we've, and he believes strongly that while we're decimating some programs at the state level that we should continue to protect towns he believes that that's uh, unreasonable and unfair and so there's a lot of pressure that's why the TRB has come before you and that number will never the number he proposed will never happen but there may be some TRB in there before we're done um, if he insists on it and that's all obviously just a number for you folks in terms of ultimately what what the uh, pain will be uh, that towns will experience a lot more to say but I'll I'll quiet be quiet for now well not much more I can add but I guess I'll try to put this into uh, a, a bit of a different perspective than what my uh, colleagues have said 
Uh, first of all, I, I appreciate uh, the opportunity to be here. I appreciate the service that all of you uh, give to the town of Wethersfield. I see some board members here as well. Uh, and I, uh, I guess I can understand your perspectives. I've sat in all of your seats, whether it's on the Board of Ed or Council or as, as Mayor. So I, I do understand your concerns. Um, so I, when, when uh, the governor brought forth his comments, I guess on Friday, I wasn't surprised. I was, I was in a couple meetings and, and my phone was blowing up. Uh, I, I understand what that does to a town when you see somebody talk about cutting over $9 million. So don't think that, uh, I don't hear that. I mean, you guys all know, you're in tune to everything that's going on. Um, those in the general public, I mean, we're looking at a, a $5.2 billion deficit at the state level, billion. Um, there was the just recently passed CBAC agreement, which brought $1.5 billion. So in essence, we have to make $3.7 billion up. Uh, there's not a great willingness as some of them have said, to uh, raise taxes. Um, th there, there's going to have to be something uh, because the one thing I'll say, even when I talk to people that are say we have to structurally change how government operates, it's, it's really easy to say until that structure affects somebody in your family or somebody that you know <clears throat> or the town that you serve or the school that your kid attends. I mean, those, uh, let's not kid ourselves, structural changes are going to happen. And those that are jumping and screaming from the rooftops that they must happen um, may be surprised when they see what the, the effect is. I'll just say, say this on, on, on what the governor said. One of the biggest issues we're having uh, in the House, in the House Democratic side is maybe because it doesn't seem so long ago that I was sitting at this dais. There's a group of us that are not willing to support throwing the teacher's retirement onto the towns this year. Uh, I've always said if it's a discussion, if you think structurally that's something that has to happen, so be it. But the towns adopted their budget. And everybody else's towns are adopting budgets, are awaiting. So I don't feel that that's the right thing to do to the people of the town that I serve. And I'm typically not a line in the sand type of person because when you do um, what we do, you, you oftentimes have to swallow your pride a little bit and, and vote for things that you may not like. And uh, a common s a statement that's made to me by pe in people in Wethersfield are, you know, how could you do that? How could you possibly vote for this? How could you possibly vote for that? Why didn't you vote for that? And it's, it's pretty easy because we're all kind of like-minded. We might be a different, a little philosophical, but we live in this town. We have a lot of the same values. We do a lot of the same things. We care about a lot of the same things. But the people that represent Northeastern Connecticut, Killingly, Pomfret, uh, Woodstock, Belouville, or the people that represent the Fairfield County, or people that are in Southwestern and Southeastern Connecticut, small state, you can get anywhere within a couple hours. Small state, but a huge divide in, in philosophical differences and in the needs of their constituents. The people that represent the inner cities, they don't relate at all to the things that we're fighting for in the suburbs. They just don't. And it doesn't mean that their thought processes are any less important than ours. It just means they think differently. Their, pe their constituents are different. So that's kind of the... And it's, uh, you know, I don't mean to bore you with that stuff, but that's the type of stuff we're fighting. It's not as simple as saying, hey, you have 79, just go for it. You've got to pass something. We have to get a lot of people on board, and, and there will be things, as I said when I started, there will be things in this budget that I really don't like, a lot of things I don't like that I'll, that I'll vote for for the greater good to, to get to get us to where we need to be. But I will tell you, and every one of you that sits on the council and the Board of Education and, and any of the citizens that are paying attention. I'm not, I'm not really backing down on, on what's going on with the municipal aid as far as the teacher's retirement. I, I, I don't think I can. There's a lot of plans out there. There's going to be a lot more work to do. As, as Tony said, uh, those of us that are not on the money committees, we're still spending a decent amount of time up the state capitol trying to work on things, work with our colleagues, talk, try to build a consensus on things that we can agree on. John is spending a whole lot more time 
and 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 we'll continue to work. Um, uh, if you're frustrated, you certainly can call me anytime. I'll talk to you about it. I'll let you know where I am. I'll let you know where we are, where I think we are. And I'm hopeful that we'll, in the House, we'll do something before. I, I heard somebody say October. I'm hoping we can do something before then. Time will tell. But I, I'm committed to uh, doing, uh, doing something as quick, quickly as possible that can get passed and uh, that addresses some of the concerns that I've heard. I'm going to open it up. Um, I, Paul, you said that the, you know, the $10 million definitely won't happen. We all knew that was kind of posturing. Um, but if we even get hit with a couple million dollars of ECS, I mean, that could still devastate the schools a little bit. Now, do you think it could be that high for Weathersfield? Um, I, I, excuse me. First of all, I said no $10 million. I didn't say there would be no, I wouldn't think, to, I didn't promise to be no cuts. No, that's and, what yeah, I said. The extent I of it, said. I'm not certain. I'm hoping it wouldn't be $2 million. Okay. But again, it's the governor. The governor... Um, you know, exhibited tonight is really what's going on at the Capitol. The governor has pretty much, you know, he's really committed to TRB. Uh, Representative Morin says to him that's the bottom line. I mean, that, that's the way things are lining up. It's very difficult. So will TRB happen? It, it depends. As Senator Fonferra said, if that's the governor's top priority, you know, the budgets are a tripartite entity where you have the House, the Senate, and the governor, equal partners in a budget. If that's the governor's number one priority, it's going to be hard for us to beat that, I would think. But who knows? But as far as the exact magnitude, I would hope it's not $2 million. But, of course, I can't promise you any specific number. I guarantee we're going to do our best to minimize it. That's all I can say at this point. Okay, because the schools are starting in a few weeks, and the classrooms will be full, teachers will be there. So we're not really sure. If we're not sure what's going to happen, then I guess it's going to be up in the air until after school starts. Well, I, jumping on that, Don just had a good question. When's the first pay period that we have to write checks to teachers? First week of September, I would imagine. That's October. No, teachers get paid in September. So do we have funds in place to pay the teachers? For a little while. And we still haven't sent out property tax bills for vehicles. For personal right, we've property. Not, we've not sent motor vehicle bills, um, and we have second half, so. Is there a way to get the motor vehicle resolved earlier than the rest of the budget? No. If we do get a, a large, an large meeting, more than one million cut or some significant cut to education, are we gonna get relief from the minimum budget requirement? There are Conversations happening regarding MBR, um, which is uh, right now under Connecticut law, whatever you um, expended on behalf of education last year, you must do in the, in the subsequent year. Um, some people believe that that is unfair if, if uh, enrollment uh, drops or other circumstances prevail, that there ought to be some recognition of that. Um, there is a very strong education lobby in the legislature, both in and outside of the legislature. I'm sure there are members here who, who are part of that that would fight that uh, proposal for fear that it will affect children and teachers. I have said that we should examine MBR with respect to central office. Um, I know there is waste in one of the towns I represent in central office. Well, you shouldn't say I know. I believe and I've been told. Um, I can't speak to Weathersfield. Uh, I think Weathersfield is a very well-run town and I doubt that there is. But there's always room somewhere. There's always room somewhere and to the extent that we allow for some um, some flexibility with respect to central office, I think it's worth examining. I think, you know, in terms of the, the town manager's comment, I think once a budget compromise is achieved, then the implications of it will be reviewed. So right now, you're asking MBR. I think once we achieve a budget compromise, whenever that is, 
then I think the implications of it will follow up these type of issues. So it would be in hand to hand. We're all aware of it and um, what happens, I don't know. But right now, the first step is the budget. The second step is the implications of it on the towns and others. So we would consider things like that. Thank you guys for coming. Um, just, I had two questions. Uh, one was, uh, or one is about the proposal for a um, tax increase on the sales tax. Um, I know, you know, up there, there's five or six budgets that's being floated around. Well, you guys smile. There's probably seven or eight now uh, floating around. Uh, but one of the proposals is to raise the income tax or sales tax. Sorry, from six three five. Originally, it was to six nine nine, somewhere around there. I, that numbers I heard being dropped uh, a little bit. If that is the case, and that you know is part of the um, final package of the final budget that comes out, and the governor does sign it, that additional increase would go to municipalities for uh, relief having to pay the uh, teachers retirement board if I'm not mistaken well, quickly before John jumps in yes uh, that's the intent but I think as I've heard two or three times maybe more from the group behind me uh, it's we're negotiating mm -hmm. and we're negotiating with a governor that is held bent on TRB and you know we are we are talking with the there's four chamber, uh, four groups, the House Republicans, uh, House Dems, Senate, and uh, Dems and Republicans, and you know, we're, we're negotiating, trying to get some consensus to get people on, on board. So right. that's the intent right now, Mike, and that's how I understand it. And if I can only speak, I think, for all of us here, but you know, we saw it with the uh, uh, MRSA for the uh, car tax, the money never trickled back down to the municipalities. So if that is in fact the case where it's a, you know, increase in the sales tax, you know, please don't forget, you know, a commitment to the municipalities to, to get it back to us. Mike, what has Weathersfield not received in the way of MRSA that it should have? Well, if I'm not mistaken, did we get the first? We got last year's payment. We did get last year's payment. Yeah, it was mixed in with the general revenue sharing. Okay. But I wanted to make sure yeah. that because that's news to me if that didn't happen. Okay. But, yeah. And then um, with the second the, question. If I just say on the sales tax, um, you're right. There have been a number of different approaches. Nothing's been settled on. The governor hasn't indicated whether he would support a sales tax increase. There are members of my caucus who feel strongly that we shouldn't. I said on their very first caucus when asked that I would prefer not to raise um, the rate of a major tax, income, corporate, sales. I still feel that way. I may lose that fight, um, as you've heard from my colleagues, that um, this will be the ultimate in piecing something together. And there'll be, no, no one will win here. The governor will not win, the legislature will not win, towns will not win. This is what happens when revenues decline and our fixed costs, I know I'm beating this drum, but it's a reality that we're gonna be facing for some time mm -hmm. to come and some fear that we may be in a, remember we're not in a recession right now in the revenues. This is the first time in Connecticut since we've had an income tax that outside of a recession where estimates and finals or capital gains um, declined and declined substantially so there's a lot of fear that we could be in a permanent situation here, or at least for some years to come, um, which is why we have to spend so much more time than we are on growing our economy. That's, our, that's the answer to get Connecticut out of this problem. It's not cutting, spending, and raising taxes. It's growing our economy. And we rode the wave right into like 2005, six, seven. We had great returns, you may recall the governor Roland writing rebate checks to all of us. It wasn't a good policy, but it was the policy. Um, and now, after the recession, our economy in Connecticut has dramatically changed, and those workhorses of our economy have changed, and we're paying a, a price for it now. And we have to uh, retool our economy to grow it so that we're not in this permanent cutting raising revenue, cutting, raising revenue um, uh, position we've been in for a few years now. And just one final point. 
I know the governor had come out with prevailing wage uh, changes in his original budget, uh, increasing the threshold. Um, would there be consideration of that in any of the budgets proposed possibly by? Well, I don't know if it's in there. I don't know if it's in there now, Mike. Um, I, I don't think there was great opposition to recognizing some aspects that it hasn't been addressed in many years. Mm -hmm. So um, I'll do some homework and get back to you. Okay. Yeah, Michael, to, to that question, I did see that come up during some of the negotiations in our caucus, but it was never put into some of the budgets that we have seen right now. Okay. So I would have to say that right now I don't see that. Um, not to say that, at, you know, within the next two weeks then that might Coming from come, up, them. come in front of us again. Yeah. But, you know, just in regards to the sales tax, too, um, you know, we've heard from 6.99 to 6.74 now. Um, and yes, that money would go back to the municipalities. Um, but again, as, as, as Senator Fonfara said, there are members in our caucus too that are opposing it right now. Um, and a, as you know, um, and as you know me, who've been a huge proponent of electronic tolling and so forth, um, you know, yeah. something that you know I'm trying to address the caucus as we see right now that basically our um, STF fund is broke. So does that mean now we have to take money out of the general fund to replenish that STF mm -hmm. fund, which is a major infrastructure projects that right now would be at a standstill, which means jobs, loss, all that. Mm -hmm. So these are the issues that we're dealing with. And so, I mean, it's not easy, as you know. <laughs> you put up a pretty good battle this year. Yeah, almost. One vote. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Thank you, guys. Yet, Mike. That was going to be my question. <clears throat> Did you have a question? No, it's fine. I, Jody, go ahead. <laughs> Thank you all for coming tonight. It really is helpful. Um, if you could just tell everybody in the audience, some of the acronyms are obviously familiar to you guys and maybe Sorry. even some of us, but TRB, we're mentioning Teachers it a lot. Teachers Retirement Fund. You know, okay, Teachers just so that Teacher folks fund. know because yeah. everybody's here and interested. You're right. But You're right. We all talk language that not everyone is privy to. Um, just wanted to find out from you, um, with regard to that, I mean, we estimated that it was going to be somewhere around $5 million, if I'm remembering it correctly, if we had to put up for teachers' pensions here in our town, correct? It's closer to two. You think it was two? I thought it was two. That's, I think that's, that's the four. portion that the governor proposed that the towns pick up, which was one-third. One-third of the total cost. Which would have been about $2 million, but I think you're right that the total that the state is paying... Um, the, the total the state is paying on, and for those, and I have to confess, many of us did not know that the state was paying for teacher retirement exclusively on behalf of towns for all these years. $1.2 billion goes to reti teacher retirement. And the governor said, as one way of saying towns have to participate, is he proposed that $400 million of that $1.2 billion be borne by towns. And Connecticut's, I think, was the two two million dollars and um, there has been strong resistance by almost everybody on that percentage and then there's res been resistance on the part of some of as, as representative Morin indicated that towns have any responsibility as with respect to that now just quickly if I could say that um, there's a difference between um, the debt that the legislature that state government failed to fund for teacher retirement for many years and what is called the normal cost, which is the current cost to for teachers that are um, that are uh, retired going forward, we are meeting that obligation. But this is all about the debt. And some have said, "Okay, pick up the normal cost, the cost today going forward, not what you failed to pay. That town should pay that or some of that." And there's still there's still um, legitimate. Um, opposition to that position as Paul said we don't know if the governor puts his foot down on that issue it's another thing that could delay us getting to yes on a budget in fairness that's that's a reality he we have to get in, in the Senate 18 votes and then hope that the lieutenant governor is with us the house has to get to 76 but the governor only has to answer to himself he's an equal vote 
uh, to us. So that's the dynamic that we're facing. Yeah, well, if I could just, and thanks for all of you for coming, but he has to answer to all of us. Not anymore, he doesn't. What, what's the harm in putting a budget to this guy, a lame duck governor, and saying, go ahead, veto it? It very well could be. He, he would hope, and he's been asking for us to put a budget. He says almost daily he's the only one who has. Um, but he also is quick to say that he will veto a budget that doesn't meet um, his basic framework. Now, that's changing. It has changed and it will change just like it's changing for us and changing for the House. Um, but I, I think the pressure of this recent announcement by the governor with respect to um, what impact it has on towns is going to, not that we needed anything to focus us, but there's extra focus. And I'm hopeful, and I'm sure my colleagues agree, that it will crystallize. That means people moving on where they stand today. That's hard because they're, they're there representing their constituents, and that could be defined in a lot of different ways. Their constituents are their towns that they come from. Their constituents are you know, developmentally disabled um, uh, people, families a host of other issues that I know my constituents care about. And it's going to, as I said, there'll be no winners coming from this. There may be some less losers, but no winners. And I'd just like to point out the governor, even though he is a lame duck, he is the governor. He, um, the way the dynamics of the budget are, right now it, it appears like it's going to, it, it might be a straight democratic budget. In any composition, there's no way there'll be enough votes to override the governor if he vetoes any budget. I mean, the dynamics are so tight across the board. If it was a bipartisan budget, we'd lose votes on both parties. If it's a Democratic budget, that's certainly, that's a razor-thin margin. So the governor is an equal player. Even though he's a lame duck, he, he's an absolute equal partner. He vetoes it, and there's no way we could override Anthony, the one thing the one thing you said he answers to all of us. Well, we we all do, and that's one of the reasons why we're where we are. Is you know some of us are, you know I've I've heard from many of you, and we you're asking us to protect the things that are important to you, and with that um, advocacy become can be problematic if other people don't quite see the same way and and that's it's 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 a negotiation that whether you're no matter what you're doing you're all negotiating at times that's that's the real the real problem is is not not necessarily even uh, once we get to, we got to get something to the governor but we have to get something as I said before that we can all kind of get behind and 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 not and, and not beat each other up on and it's uh you know, we, we're taking ideas from everyone. Uh, the discussions that are being had have uh, the, the, the budget documents that I've seen have input from every legislator and senator. Uh, I guarantee you that. Doesn't mean that, they might, that they'll vote for it, but there's things in every budget that, that everyone agrees on and is trying to push forward. Jeff, you were one second. I just, I, if you don't mind. No, I just had a follow-up, Senator Doyle. Um, I know that we had spoken over the last several weeks, and you had worked on a really good framework about some systematic reforms, and I was curious if you had an update on whether any of that has been playing out in any of these discussions. I mean, things that we, we deal with, binding arbitration, for instance, it is so difficult to run a town when you get to the point of agreement with a union and have to go to binding arbitration, and then your hands are tied, and you end up losing. So what's going on with that? Yeah, no, um, the CBEC vote was a particularly challenging vote for all of us, and I ultimately voted for it after much contemplation with the, um, the hope that some systemic changes, we made a list of 12. One of them is the one that Senator Fonfera mentioned earlier. He's done um, arduous work on two of the 12 that he's working very hard on. One of them, he's working all session on it, actually, and we think it's dealing with the capital gains from volatility, the volatility cap that John's pushing. Those are two, and we have came up with, an, uh, some of my colleagues and I came up with another 10. They're on the table, we're working hard, and um, it's, it's in the mix, and I am gonna work very, very hard for it. 
Can I guarantee them no? Will I go down um, easily? Absolutely not. But I'm hoping ultimately they will pass because um, I hate to say, it, but where we are this year, and we brought in a New York firm to analyze, the, the, do a five-year projection of a budget, and over the next five years, about $2 billion a year of deficit. So the future is very bleak. So we're hoping to get some more of these systemic changes adopted. And there may be others. Listen, I don't have any pride of authorship. I want systemic changes that will help us down the road. That's why uh, Senator Fonferra's two are great, and we're hoping we get them passed. And the others, we hope we get them all because we need it. The road, the future is very, very difficult. So as bad as it is this year, the out years, there's no light right now. So we are advocating hard for these. They're in the mix. Both chambers are considering them. Um, I have to remain optimistic. I'm going to fight like heck for them. Thank you. Just, uh, you know, one, I also very much appreciate you being here. Thank you. Um, two things I just want to share, and I'm sure you, these are part of the debates that you're having uh, every day. But when you look at the teacher retirement piece uh, and you look at the governor's interest in moving uh, city support for education to the major cities as opposed to the municipalities, it seems to me those seismic decisions need to have some advanced participation by municipalities. And that's the problem. We're, I mean, I'm not preaching to you guys, but when I see the governor come out and say, well, we're going to eradicate these 100 municipalities and we're going to move this over to address this issue of underfunding for the major cities, that's a, to me, is a dialogue we should be participating in because our ability to respond and plan, like any municipality, is handcuffed when you're doing that in August. And, and the same with the teacher retirement. Now, there may be some merit, and I, I think you've all shared, we may have to tweak some of that. And to John's point, he may have to give some on that in exchange for some other gains. But that's happening at a time when you look at how we craft ours. If we could have been participants in January, February, March with that discussion, and we're looking at qualitative choices we're making as a town and can anticipate that some of that's going to come back to us, that gives us a, a, a considerably more leverage than here we are in September. The superintendent's got to talk about laying off teachers that have already been hired, reshuffling classrooms. And we have to look at where we're going to get some of those funds from, whether it be municipal aid cuts, whatever form they take, or shifting that teacher retirement over it. And I know, Russ, you and I chatted a little bit about that. Like, I realize this is a long, to, to a pause point, this is a five, six, seven year out thing. We should be, if we're going to make those kind of changes, I, I urge that we get to be at the table. And that we, for, I'm not saying kick the can down the sidewalk, but maybe some of those impacts can be done when we're coming in at the fresh side. And that's probably what every municipality feels. But the timeline has been very difficult, I think. And you know, we, if we hadn't passed a budget in May, I suspect we'd be out of money. So we had to make some of those choices, uh, which allowed us to issue tax bills, which is getting flow of cash into the, the community uh, management. Uh, so the alternatives obviously weren't much better. But uh, I'm not sure why the governor seems so ground in over those without negotiation. I mean, maybe it is part of lame duck. Maybe it is part of firing up the team. You know, whatever it is that, it, you know, it seems to me there'd be, and I'm sure that's what you're doing, saying, well, we've got to drive into this for the side a little bit. Well, you know, I couldn't agree with you more, Mr. Mayor. I, and I think that's why we're not passing a budget with that right. specifically in there. I think all of us, I think all of us, especially here, have said those conversations have never occurred. We cannot go back to our municipalities with something like this. It would devastate them. Mm. And I think that's the pushback that we're getting also. Right. If I could just put some perspective on this, the reason why teacher retirement, a reason why this has come up all of a sudden this year is because the way we fund towns, it's based not entirely on degree of wealth or need, but um, in, the gov in the governor's eyes, less than what it should be, and that's why he's uh, writing uh, budgets the way he is this year. But the reason, another reason why we're seeing uh, TRB in the debate is because, as an example, Greenwich gets only about $3 million a year from the state of Connecticut in local aid. But we pay $29 million for Greenwich's TRB, teacher retirement. T $29 million. That's a hidden expense on the part of the state that he feels strongly about. And so in order to get at that revenue, at that expenditure, the only way to get it from Greenwich is through TRB. 
can't get it any other way. It's only $3 million. So it's either if you're going to ask towns to participate in this, and towns will participate, the degree of which we don't know yet. And you've heard from all of us that we understand the impact. I'm not in favor of, I've fought for years against the property tax. I think it's the most regressive, harmful tax we have. And this town does yeoman work. You all and your predecessors, um, in all the years I've served this town and represented this town, I've seen it, the work you've done to squeeze every dollar you can. And then to push those dollars onto the town, I think is wrong. But that's why it's here, because we're spending a lot of money on behalf of very wealthy towns, not in aid directly, but through TRB. So that's why that issue is, is on the table now. And um, Paul, you're right that there hasn't been dialogue. I think the answer lies with efficiencies and consolidations, you know, that every town has one of everything and some many of everything and it's just not the way to go. We are the size, Connecticut is the size of a county in California. <laughs> you know. More of a comment than uh, a question, but I think what probably everyone who sits up here takes issue with, certainly the timing is probably the biggest issue that we are all saying, you know, you can't do this after, after the fact. But the, but the other issue is it seems that the most recent iteration, um, at least last Friday, punishes the towns that have been responsible. Um, See, that's a message sender right there. He, he's sending a message. He wants the legislature to, he, you know, come to the table. It's, he knows that we're working, but he wants to get it done, and he feels like the only avenue he has is to send, you know, a painful message like this. Well, it's effective. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, go ahead, Jeff. Okay. On the teacher's retirement, as you discuss that, as part of those discussions, are is there going to be opportunities for towns to negotiate contribution rates during the collective bargaining process with teachers? Are you talking about the percentage that teachers pay towards, towards retirement? <clears throat> yes. That's one of the solutions to TRB right now. Mm -hmm as opposed to the towns paying directly that teachers up their percentage right now teachers pay six percent of their uh of of their uh of it's th their pay towards teacher retirement to seven or eight percent you heard from russ and and tony on on that there's very strong uh feelings about it and uh i don't think any of us can tell you what the answer is going to be either one side will win, the other side will win, or we'll be there a lot longer. I don't know. Okay. And the September 11th date that's been in the paper, is that fiction, fact, possible? Well, they, they, they my leaders, uh, the speaker and the majority leader, said that they'd like to have a vote on the week of September 11th. Um, I'm, I'm kind of from uh, Missouri, I guess, uh, show me, but um, I would like to think so. Uh, again, if, I'll vote for uh, something that I'm not happy about if it has uh, some of the core things that are important to me. And, and you made you made a good point, um, Jeff, and uh, about the uh, what what the role of whether the town can negotiate or the board can negotiate with teachers. And I think that's going to have to be part of it. We've got to have some tools yes. in the toolbox. And, right and now the only tool we have is a knife yep. or the property tax. Yep. Uh, as I said before, Jeff, uh, as, and to all of you, I've sat in your seat. I understand what you're saying, and I want to. That's why, as the mayor said, I, I, I'm not appreciative that this is coming forth this fiscal year. I don't know if I could say that any clearer to any of you. I don't agree with it, but I'm one of 151. There's others that feel like I do. Ultimately, if we get to that point, so be it. I'm not saying that I'm totally against the concept, especially when you hear what the senator said about what we're paying for Greenwich and maybe Darien and New Canaan. I, I get that part. But the timing is horrible, and it's not right, and I don't support the timing. 
And that's one of the things that I'm really kind of sticking my guns to. You, you, I don't know if I can say it any clearer. Um, and just one last thing, Russ, on the same point, though, um, as we get close and things eventually land, one of the things I was talking with the superintendent about this past week is um, the, the ability or lack thereof to find room with mandates. And there are things like transportation and special ed services and matches for uh, magnet schools and correct schools and the mid tuition reimbursement rates, all these things, which, again, not to put more vegetables in the soup here, but when you land, if there's ability to give superintendents and towns uh, relief from some of those, that allows, in my opinion, greater uh, platitude for superintendents to say, well, rather than cutting 25 teachers, I might be able to tweak some of these decisions. Like we've got, you know, these requirements, for example, for the number of buses that have to be run because of the school enrollment numbers. And we all see as we drive through town, empty buses because of these, I mean, again, made that, those like types of legislative decisions that probably take a long time to cultivate may require more work. But to the extent that we can give in some of those room, some of that room, if in fact some mm -hmm. of this pain lands, the better. I mean, I realize that's complicated, but it's better in my mind to give those tools to the superintendent and the board of ed. Um, uh, say, yes, it, yes, it is. And then I'm going to give you an example on the, on the school busing thing. I've had three meetings with, uh, I've, I've put forth over the years, three meetings with uh, State Department of Education people, uh, state attorneys, and the, and the board's uh, folks, attorneys, to discuss the, the fallacy that you have to have a, a seat, uh, a bus seat available for every student. It's just every attorney that I've talked to at the state does not agree with that and says you don't have to. So I, I don't know where that's coming from. Um, we've had, I've had the same meeting three times with three different uh, boards of ed, uh, basically the staff and attorneys. So, but I hear what you're saying, and, and I think a lot of these things will have to come, come through, especially if there's going to be cuts. And we, we, we have to have an open mind. And, and you know, certainly willing to listen to you as council members and, and board members. And, in, you know, in, if you hear things, uh, I, think, I think any one of you, uh, either collectively as a body or individually, certainly has every right and should be willing to give us a call. Thank you. Yeah, that's... Thanks, Russ. Yep, you're welcome. Can I just add one real quick to food for thought for people? Because I know that there are board members here as well as council members and the administration, but you know, one idea that uh, in terms of uh, reducing costs um, along the lines of efficiencies, Massachusetts has said to its towns, it will no longer fund back office for the town and back office for the school system, that you consolidate that or you will lose funding. Is that something, I mean, there's an example of efficiencies where create some headroom for you to do other things mm -hmm. But there's a lot of resistance to these kinds of things. And um, the state hasn't done a good job of saying to towns, you need to do this. And frankly, you know, CCM and other organizations uh, don't come rushing in to say, hey, we want to do this. And, uh, you, know, uh, you know, by the way, the governor put in his budget, it didn't get very far, a proposal that if uh, two towns wanted to consolidate their school systems, that he would pay the highest level of ECS reimbursement that any town gets. I bet you didn't hear about that one before today. Um, now, whether you'd want to do that or not is another story, but the reality is he has put forward some proposals to reduce costs, increase efficiencies, and, um, and be rewarded for it. And we have to do a lot more of that, a lot more. I'd just like to follow up. I kind of agree with Senator Fonfara. Throughout my entire career, on council, state house, and state senate, I've always advocated, and I, to be honest, I've opposed, you know, force mandates and or force consolidations. And I guess the question is, are we getting to the point that we should do that? And I'm asking you guys whether you don't have to answer today, but we're all looking for money. The question is, should there be, I mean, and this is, it's a radical question, but should there be three duplicative bureaucracies for education in Weathersfield, Newington, and Rock Hill, three of my towns? Should there be three duplicative town governments in the three towns. That's a radical proposition, but that's something all of us should think about. Will it probably happen this year? No. But in the past, I've always listened to my community and said, no way, we, we can't have it. But it, at some point, 
Maybe we're getting there, and maybe all of you and the public has to think about it, because I've, I've adamantly opposed, because of the input from my constituents over the years, we're now at the point, should we have three th superintendents in our three communities, in my three communities in the ninth? I mean, that's a question. Hartford's you know, a much bigger community. Maybe it's different, but it's a radical thinking, but maybe it's time to start thinking about that. I've always supported carrots and not to stick, but are we getting close? I don't know. Will it happen this year? Probably not. But everyone's here saying, let's save money. Maybe it's time to start looking at seriously. And I would like to appreciate some of your input, council and the public, maybe not today, but maybe it's time to think about that. And I would throw that to you at some point. I would like your input. Jody. Senator, to your question, I think that that is a very valid discussion. And quite frankly, I think a lot of the times that we've talked about that in shared services, you kind of hit a wall because you have union obligations that you have to consider. So if there could be some flexibility with that, I mean, that would be tremendous. I think that that sometimes is a sticking point for us, unfortunately. Um, I wanted to ask you guys about the education cost sharing. I know the formula is kind of up in the air because of the, the lawsuit that occurred and, and is still pending. So what guise, I guess, does the governor have to shift the dollars around in his, in his executive order? I'm just not following where he's having the authority to do that. I thought that was a legislative thing. In the absence of a budget, somebody has to run the government and he's the governor and he has that power. Until we pass a budget, he has the ability to, to um, fund programs within the law. Um, and um, one of the, one of the um, uh, findings of the court was that um, the towns were not, particularly uh, poor towns, were not being funded adequately. He could argue that that's part of his effort there. Now, the court also said that other towns weren't being funded properly as well, and um, I think Weathersfield is probably in that, that category. Um, but that requires more money, and um, there are legislators. I know there are some in my caucus who have put a lot of time into that effort of trying to figure out. I think they've recognized this might be a tough year to do that, but there is momentum to change that aspect of how we fund towns. So barring any kind of, and this would be the worst case scenario, budget by the first time the ECS money has to go out the door, that 25%, we're going with the executive order? Um, he, you know, who, who knows how he ultimately um, funds it, but that's what he has on the table right now. That's why the need to get this done one of the many reasons why we need to get it done. Thank you. Got a question? Go ahead, Mike. Um, before I ask my question, uh, Senator Doyle, I do agree with we've tried for several years to com even combine services within our town. And just combining the non-educational expenses out of the Board of Ed into the town could save us money. But I think Jody's right. You run into these union contracts, and I think, you know, if you could help us with that, that could be a big deal for us, and we could start doing some things within our town, because it's a lot harder to do it outside your town, like you would know, like combining three towns. But I think we can do something pretty immediate to do stuff within our town. Would you consider multi-towns or no? I'm, I'm, cur I'm, I'm curious, and it's not going to happen this year. I'm starting to wonder where we're going overall, and I've never supported my entire career but now I'm, so I'm curious, Mike, what would yeah. you think? Would I you... haven't thought about okay, multi-town, right, well, okay. but I've thought about only because we have a hard time doing it within ourselves, that if we can start doing it within ourselves, maybe we can start thinking about other things. But if we can't do it as just Weathersfield, then how are we even going to even think about doing it? Right. So I had a, a couple questions, too. Um, there was a couple things on, in the budget, and I don't know if they're still there, on letting towns tax restaurants and tax hospitals, is that is that still up? In, is that still in a debate? Because I would think that you know if if it's uh, some towns do and some towns don't, it kind of puts towns in a precarious position. Yeah, um, I can tell you, Mike, that I do not support, um, as chair of the finance committee, um, 
where you're pitting one town against another even more so than already exists. A lot of competition between towns, mill rate, schools, parks. You don't need that to be the tax structure to be an additional one. Although mill rate is part of the, the tax, it's property taxes and it does influence people's decisions. So um, I, I don't think that's good policy. Uh, the hospital tax is um, an effort to help Hartford and um, other host communities that have hospitals in them. I don't believe you'll see that in the end. There are negotiations going on between the governor, the o OPM, and, um, and hospitals. They'll meet again tomorrow. I'm cautiously, I don't want to even use the word optimistic, but I'm hopeful that a positive resolution can come from that. There's a pending lawsuit. The hospitals have sued the state of Connecticut because of the way the state currently um, um, reimburses uh, hospitals for Medicaid and a, and a number of other claims. They'd like to settle that lawsuit. The state would like to settle that lawsuit. And hopefully from that will come a resolution regarding um, the funding of those host communities. Thanks. But it doesn't mean there won't be, there's still the possibility of a, um, of something like the restaurant tax that's not been removed from the table. Okay. Thank you. One, more mic. one last question, and we're going on an hour, and I really do appreciate you guys uh, being here. Um, to Jody's point earlier with acronyms and all that, I'm going to bring out one, uh, the implementer. Um, the dreaded implementers that we all know about. There's the budget and then there's the bills that come out afterwards to implement the budget. One thing possibly to put into the implementer food for thought is that if there is a cut to ECS for municipalities that um, the ECS funds come to the town side and then we pay the Board of Ed or the Board of Ed's funds come from the town. Um, if there is a cut in the ECS funding, though, we would ha we would feel it on the town side and not the Board of Ed side, if I'm not mistaken. Yes, ECS comes to the town. Right. So we would be losing, say, in Paul's point, if we're at 10-3 right now or 9 and change, whatever it is, and we lose $6 million or something like that, that we would, on the town side, feel the $6 million hit and not the Board of Ed. So maybe give some leeway or latitude for that in the implementer we need to reopen our budget basically yeah we would have to that's why the mbr becomes such an issue because without mbr relief if there's a dramatic cut we have to make up the dollar for dollar difference we've You're already budget, correct yeah versus the impact fiscally Right, because we've already promised to allocate a certain dollar amount, and if that money doesn't get sent back to us via the state, then we have to come up with it on our side of the budget, so to speak. So for those towns, and I think pretty much all of them have already adopted their budgets, even those that were holding out until the June 7th um, deadline. So okay. food for thought on the implementer. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Thanks. Thank you again, gentlemen, for coming. We appreciate you taking time out on a Monday night. I know you guys have fought for us for years at the municipal level, and we've been benefited by that. I'm sure you're going to keep doing that for us, and we're grateful for that. I'm sure all your constituents are as well. Thank you for being here. And thank you all again. And before I leave, I just um, I think I thank you all for your service. It's appreciated. Uh, three of you I uh, may not see again at this level. Uh, mayor, Deputy Mayor, and uh, former Mayor Hemmen, I especially want to thank you for your service. Your, uh, the town has uh, been very benefited by your service. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, public comment? We'll move into public comment. Who are wishing to speak this evening? Deb Cohen. Thank you all very much for this time for um, public comments. And um, I hope you will not be offended that I'm going to read my statement. I'm tired enough so that I want to make sure I don't leave anything out. I will. And this is on a quite different topic, so here we go. Detentions of undocumented residents in the United States are growing in number across the country. 
in many cases resulting in the deportation of people who have done nothing more than come to this country under dangerous, life-threatening conditions in order to escape untenable living conditions in their own homeland. Their reasons for coming in such a manner and remaining undocumented once they arrive are many, but the fact remains that most immigrants who arrive in the United States are contributing members of their communities whose only interests lie in living a safe and productive life with their families. I'm happy to say that after meeting with our police chief, James Setran, and school superintendent, Michael Emmett, I feel assured that Wethersfield is a town committed to protecting all of its residents to the fullest extent of the law. Now is the time to make a public statement to that effect so that all of our neighbors, documented and undocumented alike, can feel the sense of inclusion and safety that most of us take for granted. Undocumented residents may feel reluctant to report crimes against themselves or others if they're afraid that questions about their status, having nothing to do with their report, will result in being reported to immigration. Parents of school children who have issues concerning their children may refrain from reporting those and coming to the school system for the similar reasons. Connecticut's Trust Act, passed in 2013, defines the circumstances under which a prisoner in the custody of state or local police or corrections can be held in custody solely on the basis of an ICE detainer request. I learned in my meeting with our police chief that not, that not only does our police department act in strict accordance with the Trust Act, but they do not engage in questioning people about their documentation status for any reasons not required by law. This approach should not only be respected, but shared with our residents who may be living in the unfounded fear of being unlawfully questioned and detained. Cities and towns across Connecticut have made their stand on this, public, on this issue very public. The vocabulary may differ by location, but the intent is the same. Bloomfield has de declared itself to be a welcoming and inclusive city. Wyndham Willimantic has passed a resolution declaring itself a sanctuary city that spells out what town officials will and will not do, ending with an important clarification that says, be it further resolved that nothing in this resolution shall be construed to prohibit town employees from cooperating with federal immigration authorities as required by law. I'm not asking that Wethersfield adopt any new policies. I'm asking that we adopt a resolution that publicly states what we stand for, what we will and will not do to safeguard the privacy and fair treatment of our undocumented residents, and to make our resolution public so that those most affected, most affected will know that they live in a community that will not pursue an agenda of deportation. I hope that this is a matter that town council will make a priority. I urge that a community dialogue be started as soon as possible, and I wholeheartedly volunteer to be part of that process. Thank you, Deb. Um, I do have a question. Um, okay, we can't do a two-way, but you can ask the question and we'll certainly get back okay, to Okay, um, I'll put it in the form of a statement. I hope to hear back from members of council about <laughs> opening that conversation. Thank you. Thank you. Other public comment this evening? Yes, Hi. thank you. So my name is Dorothy Devink. I'm from 22 Harmon Court. Um, I've lived in Wethersfield since 2009, and I love this town. This is where we have chosen to build our lives and raise our children. I love it here because I feel safe. My kids can grow up in a community that is loving and strong. There is a sense of security here that our family and so many others thrive on. This is something that I wish for all of Wethersfield's families. Hate, ignorance, and anxiety thrive in the dark. There are families in our community who need to know that Wethersfield is using its moral compass and will do what is right by adopting a public statement of inclusion and welcoming in regards to our beautiful immigrant neighbors, documented or undocumented. Thank you for listening. Thank you. Other public comment this evening? Uh, my name is Helen Darache, 20 Oxyoke Drive. I also have mine in writing. Um, as a lifetime resident of Wethersfield, I know that our diverse population is a big part of what makes Wethersfield a wonderful place to live. I am raising three teenagers here, 
and I have chosen to raise my children here because it is a caring, supportive, yet very diverse community. I have become fearful in recent months that some of our residents may not feel safe in our town and may not feel welcome here. Uh, after meetings with the superintendent of schools and the chief of police, I do believe uh, that our schools and our police force do not support the deportation of our immigrant population. Uh, one way to ensure a harmonious population in Wethersfield is to make all citizens aware that they are safe. I wish to ask that the town council uh, come up with a statement and proclaim that our undocumented citizens will be protected from ICE overreach so that they do not have to fear that their rights will be forfeited. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Other public comment? Tom? Good evening, Tom Mazzarella, 600 Walcott Hill Road. <clears throat> I uh, had hoped that the delegation would have st uh, stuck around. Uh, I, don't, I don't like to speak about somebody uh, when they're not here. They could hear it, but perhaps uh, some of my comments could be passed along. Um, I, I tried to listen closely to what they had to say. I disagree with a couple points. Um, there seems to be this conception that all of a sudden we're in this big problem and this huge deficit. Uh, the numbers have changed, they have increased, but the problem has been there for many years. Um, back in November, Mr. Young came up here and briefed us all on the uh, report that comes out every November 15th. It's the fiscal accountability report. And that report showed a huge deficit for this budget period and getting drastically worse each year for the five years that the report covers. Uh, the issue of the teacher pension fund has been snowballing for years. And, and Tonight it sounded like, well, this just came up. We have to do something now. And maybe that's the governor's decision, but th these are problems that have been going on for years and years. Um, their timeline for getting this budget in place is ridiculous. How are you supposed to run the town? They haven't even signed the budget. They're not even close to signing the budget. I'm, I'm sure they don't cut checks to the town <laughs> the day after they sign the budget. Uh, where's Jeff supposed to get the money to pay the salaries? We're supposed to dig into our rainy day fund to try and keep the lights on? Uh, they're going to take all the educational funding away, or a, a big portion of it, yet they're not going to give you any relief on the minimum budget uh, requirements? That's, that's ludicrous. I mean, if I was Mr. Emmett, I'd sit there and say, hey, get, that's your problem. Give me the $58 million. You know, if you have to lay off the entire town staff, so be it. But we got all our teachers. I don't think that's right. And I think you guys should push that uh, harder onto our representatives. Like I said, I don't want to speak badly. They're not here anymore, but that, that's the reality of it. Uh, You know, for, for weeks and weeks and weeks, we heard about the, the employee concessions. And, you know, I read the paper every day, and the, and the, the uh, gist I got out of it was that, you know, once we get this big concession from the unions, everything's going to be rosy. Well, they did make a deal. It's a good deal for the union workers, state workers. They got job security, they got benefits. Uh, you can't just cut 20% of the state workers. They got a contract now that says you can't do that. So it all falls back onto us. So what did we get out of that? We, we didn't get anything out of that. It's, it's, 
It's just ludicrous. And I guess the icing on the cake was, you know, we're working really hard on this. We're, we're meeting every day. We're, we're negotiating, trying to come to a consensus. But hey, I got a summer vacation planned. So let's all take off for a couple weeks and, and go on our holidays. And we'll get back into it in September. That, that's just nonsense. And, and when they do finally sign a budget, there's going to be this news article that says, oh, we had to stay up all night. We were there till midnight trying to get this thing nailed down. You know, we'll pat ourselves on the back. This is ridiculous. It's, they've known for years that the budget needed to be signed by July 1. They've known for years that there was big deficit problems, big problems. Yeah, it got exasperated by some of the income. The problems existed, and I think you guys should convey your dissatisfaction with their with their performance. Thank you. Thank you, Tom. Chris, you were. One. Yeah. I'll be very brief. Thank you, uh, Chris Healy, 27 Dorchester Road, resident here uh, since 2001. Uh, Tom actually took all my good material. Uh, but I'll just say this, that uh, the, I like the, what many of the both sides talked about uh, having to do with the problems you face, the, re the great opportunity you have to talk about uh, all kinds of relief from the uh, rules and regulations and mandates that don't work, that are expensive, that don't serve the interests of the people of this town or many other towns. And I think that is something that for where you can continue to promote in whenever way you can educating the public on. Uh, I just want to say without, again, getting into a didactic political debate, there have been lots of proposals um, put forward by the other side of the aisle, the Republicans in Hartford. Those have not been brought up. Those would have held us harmless here in Wethersfield on the education side. Uh, my friends here, the Democrats, all of whom I know very well, are are good, honorable people, but uh, I think they're being a little disingenuous about uh, the problems they face. Uh, this is a moment of truth for this state, and unfortunately, as we know here in Wethersfield and any town, no matter who's in charge, we're at the end of the food chain. And um, the money that we receive from the state is our money, your money, their money. And the fact that we have to wait until everyone gets around to it, uh, passing a budget, which puts a tremendous strain on our education system, the teachers, the parents, the, the students, who now don't know if they're going to uh, be able to have a proper school year, is held up by, the, by a lack of urgency in Hartford. There is a lack of urgency. There aren't any meetings going on all the time. I will say that because for purposes of full disclosure, I work at the legislature, so I kind of know when people are in the building. Um, we are faced a as a town um, with higher local property taxes, um, no matter who's in charge, unless uh, we speak clearly about the priorities that this legislature should be focused on, which is providing a solid quality education for all our kids. It's in the Constitution. It is the primary responsibility of the government. Uh, and I think that is something that we need to, across the aisle, hold fast on. And I've been encouraged by the comments from both sides here tonight to talk about what is at stake. Uh, and I will say one little thing, not that, that I'm from Greenwich, Connecticut. Uh, my friend, Mr. Von Ferris, said that the teacher's retirement thing was prompted by all the subsidy we give to Greenwich, I will just say this on behalf of those poor people in Greenwich, they generate almost $800 million in revenue to the state of Connecticut, so they do kind of pull their weight in terms of the taxes that we do give them back some. However, I do agree we do give them too much money, you know, those people in Greenwich. But uh, as far as weather seals concerned, um, other point to the people that were speaking here about this issue of uh, being a wel welcoming uh, civil uh, town for people that are here legally or undocumented. Undocumented is illegal. And um, I, for one, think it's great that we're doing everything we can to assimilate people here. But I'd just like to remind people that we are a nation of laws, and we can't sometimes pick and choose laws that we want to obey because we don't like them. We don't like the laws. 
We petition our government to change them. Um, and I'll do one final thing. My one side of my family came to this state in 1848, and they followed the laws, and they got assimilated. Uh, it shouldn't be too difficult for those folks here to come out of the shadows, and I'm all for helping them get assimilated and getting them legal and not sending them back. But I did think it's, we go down to a dangerous path when we say as a community, well, these are great laws, but we don't think we should be standing up for them because they make us uncomfortable. If we don't like the laws that we have, petition your people and change them. But it's dangerous to say, this law we don't feel like following. And with that, I will pass. Thank you for your time. Thanks, Chris. <coughs> Gus. There's definitely no money for a stop sign, Gus, I can tell you that. <laughs> good evening, Gus Colantonio, 16 Morrison Avenue. Uh, I guess it was a good presentation tonight. Uh, and I have some comments. Uh, I guess Pam Farah mentioned that uh, basically they have lobbyists inside the Capitol and outside the Capitol in favor of the Board of Education. That's true. I always said, because it doesn't happen right here, who represents the taxpayers? That's what we need probably. Lobbyists up there to represent us because I don't think anybody does it. Uh, you know, I am an immigrant and I guess everybody can tell. Uh, I still have an accent. You know, I came into this country in 1962. Uh, because of the laws, I lived away from my parents for a whole year. My mother was born here, but she was in Italy. She had to come right here, get the papers in order, and for me to wait a year back in Italy with my aunts, okay, before I could come. We were sponsored, but not by the government, by somebody right here. Okay, and we did what it took. We assimilated. Now, when you say illegal immigrants, they have the right of this and that, what does the word illegal mean? Just because like, you know, 10, 20, 30 years go by, you still broke the law. It seems to me anyway, you're still illegal. And go back, do it the right way, and then we'll welcome you back. But just to break the law and get this, oh, we got married right here, now we got kids, this and that, you still broke the law. And if you're illegal, you should make it legal. Back to the stop sign now, Mr. Mayor. Uh, I got in touch with the police, and I talked with uh, Officer Power, and, uh, and I said, uh, by the way, you know, the report was done in 2009. Are you aware that construction went on three years ago? And he says, no, but you know what? He says, I'm no longer in charge of that department. It is Mr. Mit Mitney. Mitney. Yes, and I met with him, and, and basically uh, we talked for 10, 15, 20 minutes, and, and he listened. And he says, it's not up to the police, it's up to the, the town manager to see if we need a stop sign or not. Wow, talking about getting the, the runarounds. I got right here, you're telling me that the mayor tells me that, that, that the state traffic commission as to give approval to put a stop sign on a local street. I asked the town engineer, he wasn't there though, I talked with somebody else, did we get a permission to, to put two stop signs on Main Street? A lot of people that I spoke to says no, the answer is no. It's, it's just amazing, where, where do I go? Basically the mayor says that we have to go to the state, the police says no, you know, the town manager has the thing. And, and I would like now, the, the town engineer is right here, someday, basically, why don't you review the intersection of Tifton and Morrison Avenue based on the intersection of sight distance that I got from the, the town, which are good for 24 miles per hour. Matter of fact, an accident happened in the vicinity two days ago. I don't know if you know. I'm going to review it and see what was the cause for that. And then come here and tell me, basically, that what we have, it's a safe intersection. Because none of these people, even though they are educated a lot, I don't think they know much about engineering, you know. And then, and then probably, probably I'll go away, but I don't think so. Basically, the intersection side distance is good for 24 miles per hour. The posted speed is 25, 
and people go, the 85th percentile goes 31 miles per hour. That means 15% of that go more than 31 miles per hour, and yet I haven't been able to get any place. Uh, on a positive side, thank you for fixing, uh, I guess, you know, the curbing and, and, uh, and Morrison Avenue. And now, are we gonna fix uh, the curbing or something right here on Church? You see a lot of debris falling down and there is still there, there is gravel. If old people walk on gravel, I think they can fall. And I think it's very dangerous. And it's been there over a, a week or so now. Something should be done. Thank you. Thank you, Gus. Yes. Oh, <clears throat> excuse me, Casey White, 91 Center Street. I also want to uh, ask and encourage the town council to adopt a resolution like the one that Deborah Cohen and um, Helen and Dorothy have brought up. Uh, as they all stated, uh, it would be simply a resolution stating what we already do, what our policies already are, and that we're going to follow the laws that are already in place. It's not a change of any practices simply a statement so the public has some transparency about what our town employees and officers are doing and how they plan to respond to different situations. That sounds really reasonable to me and it's something that other towns have done. We wouldn't be leading the way doing something nobody's done before. We could follow the example of other towns that have already done it, making it very clear that we would um, follow all the laws that we are required to and that's what we're already doing. Uh, I was really happy to hear that, and I do hope that Weathersfield can, um, we can communicate to all the town residents um, how we operate in certain situations so that people don't have to be fearful unnecessarily and um, you know, maybe have costs of the community that we otherwise wouldn't have to see. So um, thank you to Deborah and for bringing that up, and I hope that we continue this conversation. Thank you. Thank you, Casey. Hello, thank you all very much for your service. I'm Juliet Manolin. I live at 12 Lexington Street. I just want to stand in support of a, a townwide statement of inclusion. Thank you. Thank you. Other public comment? Bob? Good evening, Robert Young, 20 Copper Mill Road. I believe that our police should follow the laws of the land, starting from the federal side. And if they don't, we may be in jeopardy of funds and whatnot. And I don't think we should be harboring people who don't belong here. I know my relatives came here many years ago and they went through the process and they're here forever. These, these undocumented people that have come here have snuck in, have not followed the rules and there shouldn't be anything for them at this point here unless they went and through the process. And the process is you file when you're out at your country and you, you wait and you work through the process. And if they don't do that, they don't belong here. Um, I was surprised tonight to see our Hartford delegation or town delegation from uh, Hartford uh, here to address us on uh, the issues of the day and of the week. Um, the idea that we're hearing from our representatives about the economy is in a detrimental changes. It's, uh, uh, you know, there's, there's a lot of difficult discussions going on. I, I think these discussions and all of that have, should have been taken place a long time ago. We all know for a long time Hartford's been in trouble. The state of Connecticut's been in trouble. Um, I've shown you various reports over the time. I don't believe any of you looked at it. 
maybe here at the moment, and you never went back to it to understand what's happening with the costs for the state of Connecticut. Um, they talk like they talked about fixed costs, which is a great deal of their expenditures up there, but they just locked us in just last week or so with a union deal that I don't see how we can get out of. And it's too bad that Mr. Doyle, Mr. Um, Guerrera, Mr. Morin, and who's the other one? Fonfera. It's too bad they left because they did the same thing the Board of Education does when they come in and present their budget to the town council in front of the citizens. They get up and leave after they give their presentation. I think last year they, a couple of them stayed or some of them stayed because I've mentioned too many times of that issue that they leave. But it's too bad our guys left because I wanted to say some things to them, especially about this union deal. You know, Paul Doyle, they, they praised him in the paper of being a conservative and how he was on the fence. Same with Joan Hartley from Waterbury and Gail Schlossberg from Milford. But I can't really talk about the other two, the two ladies, because they're not part of my town. But Mr. Doyle is definitely not a conservative. A left winger, I would, I would put him at. He has locked us in to a contract that's going to go on for 10 years or how many years it is. Um, I don't see any hope. But the only hope I can say is I'll be talking from this podium when he's running that we should not vote for him. You know, there was another name back in 1991. His name was Gary LeBeau. Well, Gary LeBeau was the last person to vote on the Connecticut state income tax. And you know how he voted. We've had a state income tax ever since. And his name should be in gold because he was the one that pulled it off. Mr. Doyle, same idea. He pulled off this 10-year deal with his colleagues. And, and now we're going to be in big trouble. I mean, it's bad enough. Moody's has been treating the state of Connecticut so badly with their ratings and downgrading them. And just because of that, you would have thought these guys would have finally had a backbone. And because of some of their problems that they were whining about tonight, that's our delegation, how the demographics have changed in the, in the, in the House up at the state capitol, and how the, demo, the demographics have changed in the Senate, there's all these difficult problems now. That means things are getting, getting a little more even on the voting issue, and they've got to call in the lieutenant governor. Boy, she, when they called her in, and then I saw this in the paper about the union deal, she's number one to get rid of, in my opinion. But she probably won't run, and if she does run, you know that's going to haunt her, and that's good, because you get rid of her. But the fact is, Mayor, we, we have our own problems, and this, whether it's $9 million taken out of our our, our, our amount of money that we get from the state, or if they take two, two million dollars, it's going to be a lot of money. And to make the rest of us pay for it after we send so much money every payday to Harford, to the state of Connecticut, and they give us so little back. I've, st I've st spoken numerous times about how we should be paying our own town not the state of Connecticut, on payday. We shouldn't be giving them anything. At the end of the year, we should decide how much we think they were worth. That's exactly what they do to us right now. They're saying, how much are we, town of Wethersfield, worth to them? So many few dollars. That's all they tell us. What an insult those SOBs are out there. And it's too bad our four guys were not here to hear me talk like this. Because I don't, I, I don't know, I think what we need to do, and I've spoke more, more than once, we need to find ways of cutting back on our expenditures, Mayor. 
We need to look at closing down some school. We need to look at closing something. You just tied us up this year, and I know last at the last meeting, I was ranking you down over the Standish House. Would be nice if we had that $42,000 from the Standish House in our pocket now, but you gave that money away. You just tied us up for how many years with a transition academy for a minority group of our students. Extremely small minority. You tied us up for what, 10 years? I'll look forward to and now, five and minutes. And now we're up. seeing, now we're seeing that, you know, the schools are gonna have to contract because we, we have this. And then we look at the Weathersfield High School that you folks all voted for. Bob, if you could uh, save your comments for the second five, thank you. Sure enough, and I will be back, Mayor. I know you, you know will. that. I know, thank you. Hey, thank you very much. You're Good welcome. to see you all the time. Other comments, public comment? Yes. Uh, Farah Evanson, 570 Walcott Hill Road. Um, I'm just here to extend my support to Deborah, Casey, Helen who spoke, um, just a side note, we're not asking for any laws to change, we're not asking for anything different to happen, we're just asking for a statement, a symbolic statement, if anything, for our residents who are from immigrants from other countries just to feel safe and welcomed. Um, and again, another side note, a lot of people refer to immigration back in the 60s or the 20s or Immigration laws have changed a lot. Back in the days, all you needed is money for a, you know, a boat trip and you could call yourself American in a way. Now, it's not the same. Some people are fleeing persecution um, and when you're running away for survival, sometimes you do things that are maybe not fully legal. And Again, we're not asking for any rules to change. We're not asking for anyone to do anything different other than come out and say, we're a welcoming town. And just the procedures that are in place now by our police chief. So I'm just extending my support to what they said. Thank, Thank you. you. Other public comment? Okay, good. Finish public comment. We'll move on to council reports. Council reports this evening. <coughs> Tony. Uh, the Economic uh, Development Commission met and we got an update on uh, status of vacant properties. The Finance Subcommittee of EDIC has started working on updating the uh, tax incentive program to bring it in line with uh, the changes that have occurred in uh, state policy over the past few years. Uh, the uh, we were advised the restaurant at Putnam Park is open. Uh, they hope, or the the grill, the bar and grill is open. The restaurant itself is in the works, and they hope to have that open by October. Uh, the Beaver Book uh, Veterinary Clinic is open on the Silestine Highway under uh, a temporary CO. Uh, we were advised that uh, Pasta Vida is coming into the Marshalls Plaza. Uh, Restaurant Depot is going into where New Britain Candy was. Uh, with a, um, it's not the place where you go into, it's gonna be an online getting stuff from them. And um, we, uh, and that's what I had for EDIC. Public Works had a meeting to review architectural specs for replacing the uh, roof on the Stillman building, painting the Standish house, and painting the Solomon Wells house. Uh, we asked the manager to go out and get us some bids on Stillman roof and Standish house, just so we'd have that to look at so that once we see what's what with funding, we can move forward if available. Uh, the budget and finance committee meeting uh, group met last week. Uh, we reviewed uh, year end transfers that will not be approved in town. So we see how things stand with the state budget. Uh, we reviewed possible cuts in the 2017 18 budget where we see how we make out with the state. And we reviewed an ask me contract, which is on tonight's agenda and uh, reviewed some leasing bids. Thank you, Tom. Steve? 
Uh, last Monday, I attended the building committee uh, uh, meeting, um, and those who have driven by the high school recently uh, may or may not have noticed that the roof screens are now um, uh, being worked on. Um, the support brackets, I think, are all installed, and some of the panels uh, have actually started um, uh, going up. Um, that work should be completed uh, in the next week or two, I believe, was the, uh, was the outset of that. Um, as far as remaining work, uh, I believe the punch list uh, was done except for one item as of last Monday. I, I assume that has been completed, but if it has not, it will be certainly before school starts. Um, commissioning of the air conditioning systems uh, still remains to be sure that everything works as, as promised and, uh, and, and to certainly make sure the town uh, employees uh, understand how these systems work, and how we can move forward with these systems. Um, from the financial side, the, uh, uh, there still uh, is a little north of uh, $200,000 in the contingency and the allowances, and that would be inclusive uh, after, assuming we approve, there's a change order on tonight for some construction management for, uh, uh, frankly, the work that was done over the summer um, on, the, uh, on the roof screens uh, after the contracts had ended. Um, and uh, uh, finally, there was an issue with some of the doors uh, in the building, and, and those have been uh, um, corrected. The manufacturer, uh, 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 I believe it was the manufacturer, uh, has come in and, and replaced some of the uh, door stops that, that were not, uh, um, that, that were breaking. So they, to the extent uh, uh, that that's an issue that's ongoing. But other than that, the, the, the project is, uh, is obviously winding down. Thanks, Steve. Can I ask a question? Sure, Mike. Um, you said the air conditioning. Was that, is there, has there been problems? Is that why it hasn't been turned over? Did you say the air conditioning hasn't been accepted? There were the issues that we had mentioned a few meetings ago, um, but the commissioning is, is, has been some, we have a commissioning agent that was part of the project from the beginning, so that's not, um, but certainly there were problems at the end of the year okay. and they're working on, they were working through those and I think that those had been mm -hmm. um, established. Whether when there are students in the building, <laughs> everything will, will be, I mean, we'll see in a couple of weeks probably okay. how, that, how all that works. But, but certainly, uh, certainly the committee is, is, is paying attention to that, uh, that issue as will the commissioning, uh, commissioning folks. Mike Rell. Uh, the Historic District Commission uh, met uh, for the final time with Kristen Sturley as the um, Historic District Coordinator uh, earlier this month. Uh, Kristen had devoted uh, about 12 years of her um, time here in Weathersfield to the Historic District Commission. Um, many credit her, including myself, a former member, uh, for bringing that commission into the 21st century. Um, I would like to, I know she's not here. She's getting her kids up in uh, ready for school up in Massachusetts, but I would like to uh, commend um, Ms. Sterley for uh, her dedication and her work with the uh, Historic District Commission here in town. Um, we are the biggest, uh, largest historic district uh, in all of Connecticut. We take pride in that district, and uh, for um, her service, I would like to commend her. Uh, I would also like to say that there is a new historic district commissioner coming in, or historic district coordinator coming in. Uh, he should start shortly. I'm sure Stephanie knows a little bit more than I do about it, um, but I would like to uh, officially welcome him in when uh, he starts um, and would like to uh, at least sit down with him and work with him on some of the issues that are going on in the district. So, thank you. Thank you, Mike. Uh, yep, Amy. Um, I attended the pension committee meeting last, uh, on, let's see, August 14th. Uh, Chris from FIA reviewed the fund performance and our pension fund continues to perform very well. The library board was supposed to hold a meeting July 25th. Unfortunately, there was not a quorum. Um, they did hold a special meeting later in the month that I was unable to attend. At that meeting, they discussed their end of, trans end of year transfers and had a brief executive session. Council uh, comment? Um, uh, Councilor Martino mentioned um, th 
the new restaurant in Putnam Park. I had the opportunity over the last several weeks to attend several different times. Um, once it's completed with the renovation to the more formal restaurant, if you will, it will be a real gem for the community with a great venue um, and a spectacular view that no other community up and down the river at this point except for maybe Windsor, maybe East Hartford still, I'm not sure if that restaurant is still open, but it's a, it's going to be a phenomenal place. Um, food is really good and it's quite affordable. Let's take it down. Other council comment? Mike Curley? Well, just kind of through, ask Jeff a question about um, a few towns now that people have been, uh, or the legislature has pushed out the budget process so far have enacted uh, spending freezes and just wondering if that's something you could look at and maybe decide for our town, help us kind of look through that since they're talking maybe October, or even end of October, that could be a problem for us. Where there has been opportunities not to spend, we have not. Um, I know the superintendent implemented a spending freeze today, Mike, uh, it's a conversation with him. Uh, <clears throat> I just wanted to comment uh, over the past few years I've been attending and representing the mayor at many uh, ribbon cuttings in town and a couple of weeks ago we had one Councilor Hurley and I were both there uh, for the opening of uh, Larissa Lake and Company Salon and Spa on Main Street uh, I can honestly say it was the biggest and most well attended ribbon cutting I've ever seen in town. Uh, for people that know, Larissa Lenucci uh, began her career as a self-taught makeup artist in 2004 and had a salon going down at uh, 281 Main Street. In 2010, she decided to uh, expand her uh, acclaim for beauty team services to over 300 brides nationwide. In 2015, her and her husband purchased the property at 146 Main Street, uh, which was a building that had been constructed in 1880 and did a tremendous job of renovating that whole building and bringing it up to what it looks like today, which is unbelievable. Uh, they've got a great many things in there and they should be commended. And uh, I think, I don't know if Council Hurdley wants to add anything to what I said. No, I think you did a good job. They definitely was one of the most well attended ribbon cuttings that I've been to. Plus what they did too is in the back of their property they had tents set up and they had various vendors, most of them I believe were from town, uh, for the other needs that people need for weddings like florist, uh, et cetera, et cetera, back there. So I mean it was not just promoting herself and her new business but also other areas in town which I think is a real plus for economic development in this town. Thank you, Tony. Mike. Amy? Um, I would like to see if we can get a status update on Cotone Field and also the diving walks at the high school. I don't know if, Jeff, you have that information or if that's something that we can get. I have Cotone Field. I have uh, maybe someone from the Board of Ed that's here has some information on the diving blocks, but that's not our project. Yeah. Well, I'm just, I just was wondering the status on those two. I can, I can follow up with Fred. hear about them. Um, thank you. Thank you, Amy. I remember I did want to know about that uh, at the last meeting. Uh, I, I know they've been ordered, but again, that's the Board of Ed project. No, I understand. I'll reach out. On Catone Field, though, the main field's done. Um, they were infilling the softball field, so this should be completed in the next couple days, all in. Still have to resolve the issue of the perimeter fence. Um, and we'll know what's necessary when we look at what liquidated damages are incurred by the contractor since the entire project was not completed on the 11th. Okay, thank you. Jody? Yeah, I just had a process question. With all this budget talk, um, I know that Tony reported about the Finance Committee talking about potential cuts should we have to bear some of what the state is gonna do. Can we get an update from the Board of Ed side of things since they are a significant portion of the budget? I'm just not sure what discussions they're having. Um, and obviously with all the conversations back and forth about ECS and MBR, it would just be helpful if we knew that they were working on a plan as well. 
I will reach out to, I know Bobby's here, maybe uh, get a report from her to the council on status. I know there are several things that are being done, so thanks, Jody. Any comments? Jeff, anything? Uh, I was going to talk about Katoma Field, but we covered that. Standish House painting is out to bid. Um, and at the Public Works Committee, um, the committee asked that we uh, create something on the website to give uh, the public more information on upcoming projects. So data services did combine or did create a page that says upcoming projects. And there's a link there to the, those two projects. And as we bring on more stuff to do in the future, we'll refresh that when projects come in on, on and off. So the full reports we got done for both Standish and Stillman are on there, along with the, the funding mechanisms the Public Works Committee looked at. And uh, we're out to bid on Standish and hope to have that back in the next few weeks. Um, Catone's done. The fuel tanks at Physical Services are almost complete. They're doing some wiring and computers uh, to get that completed. Um, Derek's here. I'm sure if there's questions on Cloverdale, uh, a tremendous amount of work's been done on that, and uh, that should be wrapping up in the next three weeks. Yes. Okay. So, and then we're going to do fall paving, and that's on your agenda this evening. Thank you, Jeff. Flores, anything? No. Thank you. We'll move into Council of Action. Uh, B1A uh, appointments. Tony? Okay. Uh, appointment to the Park and Rec Board for Colleen Matatal of 124 Wheeler Road, 8-21-17 to 6 20 Second. Motion is second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Attention? Thank you. Uh, Mike Hurley. Appointment to the Insurance Committee, Thomas Fitzpatrick, 40 Whippoorwill Way, 7117 to 630, 2019. And appointment to the Zoning Board of Appeals, Mary Pelletier, 61 State Street, 7117 to 630, 2022. Second. Motion is second. Thank you. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions? Thank you. Uh, we're still holding on two. We'll move to 3A. Uh, motion to approve PCO 958 for the Weathersville High School renovation project for construction management services, an amount not to exceed uh, $33,872. Second. We have a motion and a second. Jeff. Thank you, Mr. Mayor and Council. Um, ONG, our construction manager, was not. Uh, going to be on site. The project for all intents <clears throat> and purposes was completed, uh, but we needed them this summer because of the roof screen issue and the commissioning um, and some other things to finish out punch list. We didn't anticipate uh, working into September, but the roof screens needed some modification and the design took longer and the modifications took longer. So their anticipated schedule stretches them into September. This is a not to exceed number. And as uh, Deputy Mayor Barry stated, that after this is expended, there'll still be $207,000 left in the contingency line. Each hour will be reviewed in terms of were there uh, relation to work on site at the time, so there'll be a review of each hour expended. Thank you. Questions for Jeff on this from the council? Jody? The change order had to go through the building committee, correct? It did, and they approved it. When did they approve it? Uh, last week. Did ONG kind of give us a heads up that they were going to be running this late into the summer? I just think it's kind of odd that we're doing this after the fact. Uh, the original estimate got them got it completed much earlier where a change order would, would not have to come to council, which is there's a threshold of $20,000 change orders. But with the design having to be redone for the supports on the corners, that took an extended period of time and more coordination of the materials. Uh, so by the time the July meeting had passed for the council. We got this information. We were expecting this to be done much earlier in the season. It wasn't really an ONG issue. It was a design issue. So, When we had voted on the actual design of this as it was going through the process, they didn't put that in there. No, because, again, we expected this to be done before the summer was underway. And even when the summer started, we expected this to be over in july so shouldn't they have to eat that well again they weren't going to be on site we expected this screen issue to be resolved before we got this far 
Right, but it doesn't sound like it was our issue. It sounds like it was their issue. It's, it, it's actually not OMG's issue. It's the design issue of the screens and the amount of work that has to be necessary to mount them to the building and not get blown over in the wind. And who's in charge of that? They're the architect's engineer. So when they removed the roof or the ceilings in the, inside the building, the necessary uh, attaching points mm -hmm. were more narrow than they anticipated, so they had to redesign the corner posts. And if you look on that roof in the pictures I've sent, this is a very, very sophisticated mounting system, which took a lot longer in terms of design and getting it right and restoring the roof to maintain the warranty than anticipated in the spring. Are they paid separately, the architecture and design? Yeah, ONG didn't design it. Right, so we pay the designer separately. That was part of the two hundred and something thousand dollar change order you did. Correct. For the screens. And now this is on top of. Yes. So I'm just trying to find out. Like, I just feel like we shouldn't have to bear the cost. And that's something we'll work on as we go forward. There's conversations about who designed it and when and those kind of things but we're paying them regardless. Well, we have to pay ONG. How that gets ultimately resolved between us and the engineer is the subject of the committee's discussion. Just a question about site supervisors. Any, you know, as they're going along with this project, are there ONG site supervisors on site no matter what right now? The project still going, not just the screening project, but the whole high school renovation. No, when project. there's not commissioning or the screen installers, they're not on site. This this supervisor, though, he is an or the person is an employee of ONG. Yes, it's the same one that's been with us for the past two years. And they are paid through the building funds, or are they paid through ONG. ONG pays them but we pay ONG for their time. Okay. I have to agree with Jody on this, you know, looking at the cost of you know, man hours that's written up on the agenda, going up until August 14th, a week ago, that's when they exceeded the, the $20,000 threshold. I would have liked to have been notified end of July, early August, that this was going to go this far forward and that costs would exceed the $20,000 threshold and, and time frame of completing this would go further into um, late August, early September. They probably had known that. We didn't Did, have a meeting. No, but I would like to have been told that, heard about that. I mean, we can still have a, a meeting. We can be called in <coughs> to to know that we are you know, going to exceed a $20,000 threshold. That's you know, my concern with this. Um, you know, it, it's on top of an already expensive fix for the building. Um, I think we should have known that something like this would have been uh, a possibility when we had voted for the original $200,000. We didn't know it when we voted for that, that this would extend into the summer. Again, this was supposed to be over last September. Yeah. Okay. And again, we had, other, we had other means to screen those rooftop units. We could have painted them and so forth, but that wasn't the chosen methodology. And we spent a tremendous amount of time with the neighbors and with the Planning and Zoning Commission and everybody else to design a system that everybody agreed with and now we were paying over $300,000 to implement. Mm -hmm. So we ought to do it right, take the time, make sure the roof is secure, make sure the warranty is intact, make sure the screens aren't gonna blow over and make sure we restore the interior of the building to its proper form. And I understand it takes some time and it takes some money, but it's gonna be done properly and it's gonna be secure. Would the supervisor, is this person, giving architectural advice, engineering advice, or is this he? This person is coordinating the building access, coordinating the vendors, coordinating the installers, coordinating the roofer, coordinating the whole project. 
is not supervising. He's not. He's got hands on. He's there every day. The architect visits to make sure it's done according to the design. This this guy from ONG is there every day. They're working to make sure everybody's doing what they're supposed to be doing and verifying to the town that the materials we've paid for and the hours we paid for with the installer and the roofer and the warranties are all done properly. Okay. So he's there to make sure that our $2 million roof is intact. Is Tremco involved at all? They'll Have they be been? involved after the fact. They, they've been made aware, but this roof has a 20 year warranty. So Tremco, unless the, war the roof warranty vendor picks Tremco in the next 20 years, when this roof has a problem, they're going to call their people to take care of the roof. Okay. Other questions? And that's why it was very, very important to make sure that the roofer did this work. And actually, Silktown Roofing is the contractor installing the roof screens because there's over... 50 penetrations in the roof, at least? Close, close to 80. Close to 80 penetrations in the roof, yeah. Jeff, my memory was the committee and, and yourself and staff wanted someone there from ONG to protect us. Absolutely. And, and they did the work all summer? They did. Okay. So, again, no one is more anxious to get this project behind us than me. <laughs> it's been four years. And I, I do recall you mentioned that the ONG piece would have to be evaluated as project length when we approve the uh, mm -hmm. design plans as well, yeah. which they are our protection. So. Okay. Other questions? We have a motion and a second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? No. No. Is that just two no's? Four no's. No. One, three. 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 three no's. Right. Just show hands. Show Mike, no is Mike. Mike, Mike and okay. Jody. Thank you. Three P, please. Make a motion to authorize the disposal by auction or sale a whaler, a 1996 Cape Fear McKee boat, and Mercury 2008 75 horsepower motor. Second. We have a motion and a second, Jeff. Uh, Sally Katz, Director of Physical Services, is going to talk to us why we're why we're disposing of the fleet. <laughs> well, we got that brand new boat. A brand new boat. Yeah. Sally Katz, Director of Physical Services. Uh, the items uh, before you, the first one is a boat that we had received from MDC, um, I believe at no cost at the time that we received it. Um, when we attempted to utilize that boat, we found that it really was not seaworthy and took it out of the water. Um, it did, however, have a um, workable motor, which we chose to keep. The second boat is a Boston Whaler that had been used by the Harbor Master for a number of years. That boat um, was also deemed unseaworthy by the Harbor Master. And um, through an incident that occurred a couple of years ago when the Harbor Master had an incident on the water, the motor took on water. And since that time had not performed the way that it was supposed to. And therefore, uh, when the Park and Rec Board approved the purchase of a new boat, um, we have a take the old one out, put the new one in the water. So therefore, the Boston Whaler, um, the MDC boat, and the non-working motor are what we are requesting to be able to dispose of. Thank you, Sally. Questions for Sally? Amy? Is there any value in any of these items? Uh, the item that had value, which is the motor from the MDC boat, we have chosen to keep. Therefore, if we have any problems with the motor on the current boat, we would have um, a motor to be able to exchange it with while we do repairs on that. But other than that, the, there isn't value to us because we can't keep them in the water. It, well, is there any value at auction? I mean, are you We're hoping. <laughs> trailers get nice tires. Tra trailers, <laughs> yes. You, you, and stranger things have happened. Sometimes people buy these things for parts, uh, steering wheels. Front Question for okay. Jeff. Uh, when the funds come in for the boat, no matter what they are, which fund would they be going into? You know, those few pennies, we'll figure it out, but I would imagine they would do something back towards the cove. 
fun. Got the same fun that got the money for the boat. Yeah. Okay, good. Other questions? Okay. Motion is second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposition? Exception. Thank you, Sally. Thank you. Free seat, please. I'd like to make a motion to approve the collective bargaining agreement between the town of Weathersfield and AFSME 1303-408 for July 1st, 2017 to June 30th, 2020. Second. Motion is second. Stephanie, I know you're here for this. Good evening, Stephanie Askland, Human Resources Manager. 1303-408 um, consists of 24 members, uh, the town hall and dispatchers. The union met and they have ratified their contract. Uh, so it is now brought to you for approval. And to give you some of the highlights of the uh, end of negotiations on what we've agreed upon, one of our main objectives was to follow suit what with what we have done with the other unions and implement the high deductible health plan, uh, which we were able to do. From the standpoint of the financials, this is a three-year contract, all three years for a general wage increase of 2% a year. In regard to the pension, the defined benefit employee contribution increase increases a 0.25% each of the three years, so a combined total of 0.75% over the life of the contract. The defined contribution, that will increase 1.5% uh, over the life of the contract. It's a 0.50% increase each year. In regard to the OPEB employee contribution, that is also a 0.25% increase each year, a uh, total of 075 for the life of the contract. The insurance premium currently is at 18% for the PPO and 14% for the high deductible. Obviously, the PPO would be eliminated. The high deductible would stay at 14% for the remainder of this fiscal year. The last two years of the contract, we would increase to a 15% employee co-share on the premium. From the standpoint on the insurance, again, it's implementing a high deductible health plan for active and any uh, retirees under the age of 65. It's a $2,000, $4,000 annual deductible. So that does mean that if there is single coverage, there's $2,000 deductible every year that the individual must meet. And if it is double or family, there's a $4,000 deductible. The town would fund 100% of the high deductible health plan for the first year of the contract. For the second and third year of the contract, that funding would be reduced to 50%. The overall cost of this contract is approximately $77,000. So if we look at that on an average for three years, it's approximately $25,600 per year. Um, that averages out further when we're speaking of 24 members. Uh, over the life of the contract, three-year term, 3,208 is the approximate cost for each employee over the three years. If we break that down further per year, it's $1,069. Again, this contract is in line with what we have uh, negotiated and what we have agreed upon with other unions, the implementation of the high deductible health plan, along with the funding levels, increase in the defined benefit and the employee OPEB contributions. Thank you, Steph. Questions you. for Steph on the contract? Continued great work on all of this. I'm sure you and Jeff have done terrific. So this is following that, that progress that has been made. So we have a motion and a second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Extensions? Thank you. Thank you, Steph. Thank you. If I may also just thank the town manager for his uh, attending negotiations as well as uh, the negotiating team, Karen Tomchek, Anthony Arbio, and Frank Libator. Thank you. Thank you, Steph. We'll move to bids for A, please. Um, motion to approve the purchase of the network switches for $88,000. Second. Motion is second, and I assume you're here. And just, this is our combined technology chair. 
or uh, it's one of our shared director. Services. It's one of our, our shared, shared, services. shared service success. The merge between <laughs> the town and the BOE. Yes, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Mr. Town Manager. This is the, these are the switches we talked about at our budget workshop back in March over at the community center. This is the uh, network infrastructure upgrade that we need uh, in order to get the new phone system, the uh, Wi-Fi. Some of these switches are 12 or 13 years old. So this would take care of the switches at town hall, at the police department, at the library at the town garage and at the community center and the firehouses. Questions? Tony? Uh, Keith, looking at this, I didn't see any backup information as far as bidding on this. Is this being purchased under a state bid or through contractors that you went out to bid on that we haven't seen? Yes, this bid is uh, the state contract is Software House International has the state contract on the switches. They're HP switches, same as we have in the high school. So this is state contract pricing. Amy? Is there, <clears throat> excuse me, is there a reason that we can't wait on this bid? This comes out of reserve fund, uh, the IT reserve fund, so it's not hitting the general fund, it's not hitting the Board of Ed. And these funds we put aside for this specific purpose, you can wait or you can go forward. Um, we have a phone system that was old 20 years ago, and this is the first step in resolving that issue. Um, it, well, it, it, just, ahead, oh, it just seems to me that if these aren't um, urgent expenses, that maybe we're best to table them until we have a better sense of the budget from the state. I just, I know it's only $88,000, but you add, you take four or five of them and they start to add up. So, um, yeah, this it, money's from a reserve fund. Um, put aside for this specific purpose. So and it's up to the council. To Amy's point, could it be used for anything else? It can be used for other IT technology purchases. But not out of the scope of that. No, it was put aside in an IT reserve fund. Okay. For this, for these types of projects. This is, um, if, we, if we look at the, the big picture, town and schools, our entire technology infrastructure um, this is by far our greatest need. These switches are our biggest vulner vulnerability in terms of age, um, not receiving security updates anymore, and, and just how much it's changed in the 12 years since we've had the, uh, these switches. We rely on our security cameras, rely on the network now. HVAC uh, relies on the network. Our, all of our police systems are computerized, all of our town hall systems are computerized, so we're using our network much, much more than we did 12 years ago. And uh, these switches are the infrastructure, if you will, the roads that we're traveling on, all, all our data, all of our security systems. So um, I understand the timing of this seems horrible. We talked about it back in March. They were old back in March. Tonight, sitting here, I was realizing just this seems like the worst time uh, to do this, but this is probably four or five years past when we should have done it, and this will last us. Well, these lasted us 12 years, so if these, this next purchase lasts us 12 years, we won't be coming back to you for switches again for a long time. So, Are we more at risk of ransomware and things like that? Yes. For not doing this? Yes. Also, if you recall the... Police chief used asset forfeiture money to purchase approximately $100,000 worth of new servers. Those are sitting in boxes until we get these switches. So another reason that why we've been looking forward to this project. Other questions, Mike Grill? Thank you, Keith. I was going to ask about um, public safety when it comes to this, and you answered part of that. But of the 88000 the cost driver is police headquarters, two switches at $38,000. What, what segregates the police department out more than the community center, uh, physical services, library? It's the size of the switches at, at the police department and town hall. So you see the town hall, the two switches are 38000 The The police headquarters, the two switches are 35000 uh, it's just the number of ports we need. So the other thing about the switches that's changed is that 
um, the network draws power from the switches. So we need to not only plug in the computers at each officer's desk, but also the phones as well now. And instead of having separate power outlets, the power is drawn from the switches. So whereas at these smaller locations, community center, library, firehouses need much less uh, port density than the town hall and the police department. So in layman's terms, you're at the library, there's not 17 phones like there would be at the police department. Each officer gets a, a phone number, a VoIP phone at their desk or kiosk or, or you know cubicle or whatever they have there. Correct. Um, public safety aspect, is there, aside from what Steve mentioned about ransomware, malware, is there any other public safety concerns by not having these switches? I mean, are, do we have VoIP phones just sitting? I know you'd mentioned the, the servers, but are, do, do we have VoIP phones sitting there ready to use at headquarters or anything like that? No, the bigger issue is that these switches all have a public IP address. So they could be hacked by DDS attacks, by uh, malware, virusware, um, whether it was a directed attack to try to get information or just to cause uh, havoc. The new switches have security built in. Just like a new computer will often come with antivirus, similar with the switches, whereas our current switches uh, no longer have security updates. We're not re receiving any patches or updates similar to if you still have a computer that has Windows XP, you're no longer being protected by Microsoft. And there are towns that are being held ransom, if you will. You know, you know we're going to wipe your computers clean if you don't give us $10 million. Correct. And I know, you know, certain towns, we may have even talked about it, but certain towns are buying insurance for that kind of purpose. Yeah, we've avoided any of those types of uh, embarrassing, costly situations here in Wethersfield. We're proud of that, and this is part of that process. Is okay. continue to okay. review where our biggest vulnerabilities are. Okay. Thank you. Amy, again? Um, again, <clears throat> I understand the need for it, but um, I just think that to hold off a month may be the right thing to do and see where our budget is then, unless there's a compelling reason that we should do it tonight and again I, my view on that is and I was originally prepared to, to to hold off but I I think I'm convinced that it, this is one of those expenses that we we should do so from the from the public safety standpoint uh, and and it seems it makes sense for me to do for us to do this in my opinion now um, I would also add that uh, Jeff and I have talked a couple times over the last few weeks since our last meeting about, I guess, identifying, prioritizing, which is why B and C were pulled this evening. And um, you'll see in our final bids that Jeff is identifying those, those bids that really are much more time sensitive or really won't lend themselves to, uh, you know, a source that could be of help to us as we go through the final budget. Because, again, this is a reserve, so we're not going to tap the reserve to offset something that might come in. So I'm sure Jeff made that qualitative choice just for our assistance. And I share any sentiment, by the way, that yep. some of these items, it may make sense to look at them and wait. But from my perspective, this was one that you've convinced me. Also, if I may, thank you. One more thing is um, Dave Gove. We were talking about maybe getting this on an agenda earlier in the summer, and Dave Gove was prepared to come to talk a little bit more in depth about the next step with those servers we purchased and how those specific software systems uh, at, the, at the police department are being up, upgraded as a result. So I know they're as anxious as anyone to start to use that mm -hmm. technology that they, yeah. that they have. If I could swear on that, it, correct me if I'm wrong, that the pitch by the police department was buy these servers because you're not have to spend any money, right? Mm -hmm. and, and they didn't add in that we're gonna have to spend another 88 grand to get them even working, right? Well, I, I think I remember when this was talked about with the servers with the asset forfeiture. I, I believe Jeff did point out that we were going to have to go back once we completed the, because this isn't just the police department. This is the, mm -hmm. the library, the town hall. So that, that whole piece of the project had to be done separately because it was affecting different, uh, a different component of the project. So the server was, I remember, you're correct, Anthony. That right. No, was, I don't remember, honestly. Yeah. No, he, he did say that, that uh, coming out of asset forfeiture would not require 
funds from the town, but with the switches over, I remember Jeff mentioning we were, this would have to be separated and Keith would have to bid it through the state for okay. that piece. And again, it's not just the police department, so. Our goal was to have the switches on that same agenda when we had the servers, but we were waiting for the bid and the, um, we had an outside third party network assessment uh, and those results we had to analyze and uh, those have, have since been made available to us. Thanks, Keith. Any other questions? Donna? No, I, I just support based on the fact that this is the IT reserve um, fund and it can't be used for other than IT um, items. So it makes sense. Um, certainly the public safety component plus the fact that there's um, servers that need to be put into, um, into use that were purchased specifically. Um, if we're going to move forward, this is the first step. Thanks, Don. Further questions? Okay, we have a motion and a second for the authorization of the switches. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions? Okay, motion passes. Thank you, Keith. Thank you. Nice to see you. Um, I know B and C we have held. We'll move to 4D. Make a motion to approve the contracting for milling services to Tilcon CT Inc. under state contract number 16PSX0206 for an amount not to exceed $50,000. Second. Motion to second. Derek. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, Derek Greger, town engineer. I'm here tonight with this agenda item as part of our annual paving program. Uh, we had, we typically work off the state bid. We had worked off the state bid with Tilcon this past spring. Uh, they did a good job. Um, so <clears throat> working off the DAS uh, contracting, uh, Tilcon's a low bidder for milling. Um, like I said, they had worked in town in the spring. Uh, we're recommending hiring them again for the fall program. Uh, the road list, as you have in front of you, is a Cloverdale Circle. We had held off a portion of this road uh, pre last year uh, because of the Cloverdale Pond project that was going on. Um, with the work being scheduled uh, late September this year kind of ties in nicely with the pond project ending then being able to come in and finish Cloverdale Pond uh, Winwood Road is off of Cloverdale. So we'll do that as well as well as uh, Meadowview Drive. That's all the same neighborhood uh, Carriage Hill Drive and Pondside Drive were uh, some other roads that were on the previous list from past years that had not we had not gotten to yet So we're trying to work through that list before we move on to some new roads. Thank you Derek questions Really straightforward Seeing none, motion and a second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Abstentions? Okay. Uh, 4C. Uh, motion to approve Tilcon, Connecticut for paving services under state contract uh, 16 PSX 0209 for an amount not to exceed $350,000. Second. Motion and a second. Derek? Okay. Thank you. Um, this is uh, also this goes along with our milling so overlay program. In the spring, we had Tilcon doing both our milling and our overlay operations, uh, which did help work nicely as far as coordinating contractors. Um, as you may be aware, we usually use three contractors for our paving program, milling, paving, and we have our general uh, contract with General Paving who does our drainage work, uh, curbing, and apron work. So coordinating three different contracts would be difficult. Um, it worked very well in the spring having Tilcon uh, doing our paving as well as our milling. Um, they are also on the state bid. Uh, we, they've worked in town for many years. They are reputable and do good work. Um, so based on that, staff is recommending to use them again uh, for the fall program as we did in the spring. Thank you. Questions from Derek on this? Okay. Seeing none, motion is second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions? And finally, 4F. Motion to approve the crack ceiling with seal coating ink for an amount not to exceed $100,000. Second. Finally, Derek. Okay. Um, as we do annually, uh, a portion of our road funds is allocated just for crack sealing. Um, we do that on roads that have um, been paved probably eight to 10 years ago. Um, they are at a point where they're starting to exhibiting some cracking. So this is more of a maintenance operation. It does extend the life of the roads. Um, many municipalities do it. We've done it for many years in town. Uh, steel coating had done this work last year. Um, in town here, we use a, uh, a uh, product called PCRM, which is polymer and rubber um, type of material. 
They are on the uh, Krog bid. Um, we, we switch depending on pricing and what materials are available between the state DAS bidding and the Krog bid. Uh, this year, uh, they are on the Krog bid, um, and we have used them in the past for this. Um, they've done, generally done good work. Uh, I've spoken to a lot of other municipalities that use them as well. One thing we do want to do differently this program from last year is we usually had paid by the pound. Um, with this year, we're looking to pay by the gallon. Um, reason why is uh, cost-wise, it doesn't make a difference. What it makes a difference is being able to track it. Um, trying to track, because I don't have staff that can be with them every minute of every day, it's very hard to calculate the pounds of material they're going in. With the gallons, their equipment has meters on it, so when they come into town, we could check the meter and, and check on it periodically throughout the day to see that we're, we're paying what we're getting for what we're paying for. Um, so that's the only change in how we've done the program. Um, it's still all under what how Krog bids it is. You could do it diff, pay different ways, either by lineal foot of crack, by pound, or by gallon. Um, I'm recommending doing it by gallon this year. I think it would be easier for us to track and ensure we're getting what we're paying for. Um, as I said, they have worked in town. They've done a good job, so we're recommending uh, using them again for this program. Okay. So it's it's roughly a thousand gallons. Any idea how far that goes, and do you have a schedule of where it, where it's going? Yeah, what we do is. Uh, we use our uh, road manager software to give us a list of roads that are kind of falling into that category that need maintenance. Um, between that and just some general knowledge of the area, we select roads. And what we do is put together a, a list of roads. And we, we have these that kind of carry year to year. We, we manage the program to meet the budget. So we get through as many roads as we can on that budget. And then those that we didn't get to last year are coming up on the list to start with this year. Thank you. Thanks, Derek. Questions? Tony? Uh, just out of curiosity, Derek. Uh, I see we recently just filled in the cracks going down Griswold Road from that one section. Is this the firm that did that? This is not the firm that did that. That was um, something we had built into the program this year. This is for crack sealing of typical cracks that are half inch, maybe three quarter inch, that we they go and they spray and it looks, you can see the like spider web looking hmm. application. With that, um, with that road, Griswold, was only paved maybe uh, eight or ten years ago and you can see we had separation where the pavement joints had come together and the separation was fairly large, uh, more extensive than this type of crack program would do. So what we tried on that is there's a, a new process where it's a, it's a thicker mastic material with sand in it. So we applied it to this stretch of Griswold um, as kind of a test case to see how, that, how well that holds up. Because we have a number of roads in town where the roads are generally in good shape, but where the pavement joints come together, we've had significant separation. So we want to see how kind of this holds up. We may consider it's relatively inexpensive. We may consider that for some of these other roads that are generally in good shape, but that do have these separation problems that are too extensive for this type of repair. That's what you see out there. And we'll evaluate how that holds up in because, the future. Because, you know, after driving down and seeing it, it looks like they did a good job filling in and leveling everything off. Yeah, it's applied differently. Um, they come with a wand and do this type of application. They cover a lot of cracks with this. Um, they have a, uh, a tow-behind uh, equipment, and it goes into a bucket, and they have a maybe a 10-inch uh, by 10-inch um, trowel, like a square that material goes into, and they, they push it by hand all the way down the road. They go back and they work it into the seams as they go and make sure we get a uh, level. So there's a different application process. Like I said, it hasn't been done here in town. Um, I know it's very common on uh, for highway, um, highway repairs, or it's more common airports. They use this material a lot. So we wanted to try it. Like I said, it was relatively, this is kind of a test case for us. We'll see how it goes, and maybe it's something we'll work into the program on some of these other roads that have this type of cracking uh, developing. There. Other question, Mike? Not so much a question, but um, I guess maybe it would be a question with regard to when we do repaving, we try to do just a neighborhood, so we're not sending trucks on all four corners of the town. Is that similar with this crack ceiling? We would, yeah, because it's more mobile. It than, is more mobile, yeah. But would they? Would you guys try to focus in on an area, or would you go? throughout town because it's more mobile that's not such a criteria with okay. um the milling and paving contracts there is a fee to pick them up and move them across town there's a certain footage if we go over 2500 feet of a move then we pay a dollar mm -hmm. amount for that um, this program doesn't have that associated with it okay. because uh the equipment it's, it's the way seal coating does it is that it's all their equipment is um, self-contained on their trucks so it's just a matter of driving so there isn't an added charge so we really just try and work off the list as to what roads have fallen Priorities. into that uh, maintenance category that we want to get to before the cracking okay. gets worse and then one other final comment this does not involve any chip sealing or anything like that. We pretty much ban that in town. You know, yeah, we don't use chip seal in town. This is strictly a maintenance operation for sealing cracks before okay. they get worse, try and preserve and extend the life of the roads. Great. 
Thank you. Okay. Just one question. When's this work going to start? Uh, right now, we're looking at scheduling them uh, probably end of September. It's, it's about two weeks for them to go through this amount of work here in town. So thinking end of September, early October. What about the paving piece, milling and paving piece? Milling and paving, uh, it'll be similar. It'll be late September into early October. It's a little bit later this year than usual, uh, a couple of reasons. One, uh, just because of the scheduling of the contractors, that was the window we could have. We had some vacations um, in-house that were the personnel that are out there doing the uh, inspections, so we wanted to schedule. And it tied in nicely, as I mentioned earlier, with the Cloverdale Pond project wrapping up since we're going into that neighborhood to let it follow that anyway. Because normally we are paving a little earlier, mid-August. Well, this will be a little later this season. Can I just ask, re related to paving, I know it's not necessarily the crack ceiling. When you look at the surface of the material that we're using, so we're using asphalt, or the contractor's using asphalt to pave the streets, you would think in this day and age that there would be a better solution than the way they seal the joints. And I'm thinking there's a road in Rocky Hill, Kobe Road, so if you're coming from the Berlin Turnpike, you come down Webster Street, take a right, and you're going out to New Britain Avenue. They paved that a couple of years ago, but the material doesn't look like asphalt. It's very sparkly, so I'm assuming there's a different mix of crystals or cement or something else in the materials. Just wondering, do we ever look at different types of materials to see what might hold up better than asphalt? I'm not familiar with that location. I mean, I could certainly talk with Rocky Hill and see what it is they were using in that case. Um, there are situations where you do use a different type of mix. Um, uh, Councilor Martino brought up to me about uh, over in Weathersfield, exit three as you get off to go down to Main Street. Um, they had used a different type of asphalt around the curve of the uh, ramp and it was more of an anti-friction type of material they put down because they had a lot of sliding off. So it may be something similar this to that. This is a hill, so yeah. It, it, it might be. be. Um, generally, what we put down for our uh, top course when we mill off is a, is a hot mix asphalt. It's a super paved material the state uses. Um, a lot of municipalities use it now. Um, we use, there are different stone sizes that can come in it. We use a 0.375 inch stone which generally gives a smoother rideability on the surface and also works well when, we're, when we have a milled type of surface that we can work that material because it's a little smaller into the milled sections better. Um, that's pretty standard, unless there's some extenuating circumstance that there might be something different to use. Generally, whether we use a hot mix at that size or different size mixes, they're generally about the same cost. They don't change a lot. So they might have had a special situation there. But generally, my experience as far as these types of programs, what we are using in town is very standard. I was just curious because it's so different. What, what road did you say that was? Kobe Road. Kobe. Okay. Oh, I can find out what that off is. Off of New Britain Avenue in Rocky Hill. Next time. Okay, we have a motion and a second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Abstentions? Thank you. Thank you, Derek. Thank you. I noticed you're growing your hair out. Is that so you can pull it more as you're going through the roads? In my age, I figure if I have it, I might as well <laughs> show it off. <laughs> the minutes of July 17th, please. Uh, I'd like to make a motion to approve the meeting minutes of July 17th, 2017. Second. Any changes, deletions? All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions? Thank you. Public comment. Mr. Young. Before we jump in, can I give a, a diving block? Right All right, I heard from Mr. Bushy. This is uh, his response. The blocks have been ordered through the vendor. They are still a few weeks out. I spoke with the rep today. He does not have a date at this time, but as soon as I get something from them, I will gladly share it with you so you can update the town council. Fred. So they will not be in for the beginning of the swim season? It does not seem so. Has he notified his parents to the parents? No idea. Fred does not answer to me. Yeah. Just real quick, did we do the mosaic introduction? Oh, you don't have to take an action on that. Yeah, no, we don't even have to introduce it, Mike. No, it's, just, it's a written introduction. Yeah. Mr. Young, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Jumped in in front of for a little update. 
Good evening again, Robert Young, 20 Copper Mill Road. <clears throat> As I was discussing earlier about our visit from our four famous characters from the state capitol that represent the town of Wethersfield, I, I just felt that the way they were whining and how they're now tied, their hands are tied, there's not much they can do, it just shows how little they really, really, really know. And, and for so long, they've been, they've been the, the ones at the top of the, the pile, and, and now they've come down a few notches, and uh, things are getting tough. While they've all been in there, and as we know, and I've, I've quoted these numbers before, the state of Connecticut had uh, long-term long -term debts of $62 billion when Mr. Malloy came in. We now have 74 point, I think it's four or five billion million dollars of debt. He added on 12 million billion dollars of debt since he's been in. And while he's been in, things have been rosy. Now he's a lame duck. Now harder to get financing, even though money is cheap. He can't go much more. And that's why we're now going to get hammered by his policies. And while all of this is going on, we're seeing people leaving Connecticut. You know, there were several articles, three articles, I believe, just in a, a quick rapid recession in the Hartford Current where they said plugging Connecticut's family drain. Families are, you know, with children, they're moving out. And where are all the millennials? More of those are going out. As a matter of fact, Alaska is worse than we are which I think is understandable. But on the other hand, uh, we're second on the list as being the worst in the nation. The state is worrying decline in children. And here, all along, we have redone our high school. We spent millions of dollars on that building that we're going to pay forever and ever. And when that gets done pay, being paid off, another eternal life will come to existence. And it'll be another school building that has to be repaired. And it will just go on and on to where we have this eternal life of cost. And we're gonna see the de decrease of our students. We may be forced to become a conduit for some other town who needs to dump their kids somewhere. And you know, they don't pay. We did end up paying. And we have you folks to, th to thank for, for all of that by making our school so much larger than what we needed. And where were our great thinkers when we decided how big that school was going to be? You were the many of the, you sitting right here were those thinkers. And look, and look at the news that's coming out. And we're going to be stuck paying big amounts of money Thanks to you folks. And then, of course, we have our Board of Education that's talking about the Hamner School and talking about some kind of planning for some academy model. Uh, where does all of this end, Mayor? You know, we've talked about this year after year about cutting costs and finding ways of saving money. Obviously, we're not doing a good job of it. We're talking. What's not happening? What's happening to the shared services that we've talked about? Yeah, I know one or two groups in, in, in the town have, have finally gotten together and merged. Might have been only one, maybe two. But we have a lot more to go. But we're not getting, we're not getting any savings. Our taxes keep going up because you folks think 3% is a good number. I think zero is a good number. Negative is a good number. And as we're going out, this eternal life program that you folks have been party to is going to continue haunting us. And we'll have all of you to thank. I know you'll be gone, Mayor, which will be good. Steve is going to be gone. Don is going to be gone. But the rest of you are going to be here. And we're going to... You, you put us in such a bind. Now, I do notice, and, and you know, I keep blaming Amy for uh, always putting up all these uh, um, 
Oh, what do you call it? Benefits for towns, uh, CDBG grants, and all of that kind of stuff. I see where you got 625000 in the newspaper for that. But, you, you know, that's all borrowed money. The federal government's got nothing. They're just like, they're just like the state of Connecticut that's lo losing and has lost billionaires after billionaires. And it only takes a dozen billionaires to leave, and look where we are because the state, the federal side loses corporations that go to Bermuda and all offshore and go elsewhere and cut their costs and don't pay taxes here. So, you know, now the, 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 new, the, the, the landscape down in Washington has changed dramatically. There's the printing presses. I don't know if they're continuing on like they used to, but the way it looks up here in Connecticut, any, that money, very little money is gonna be coming here and we're, we're all going to be uh, in trouble because we send a lot of money down there as well as we do Harford, uh, State of Connecticut. And we get ex absolutely very little back. And I don't hear a peep from you folks until now. Oh, we're in a little problem here, you know? Um, oh, maybe they'll only cut us two million, million dollars from ECS money. Uh, they won't cut us nine million. Your buddy cut us nine million. And, you know, that, that showed his colors. He took care of everybody in the cities, and he took care, and he's going to take care of a lot of nonprofits with that money. That's how he's distributing it. Um, you know, the cities have, have built their own problems. Hartford, for instance. Uh, we, we recall Mayor Bronin came here to talk about he needed funds, he needed help. Uh, shortly thereafter, uh, a couple of us had made a, uh, I was part of it, uh, an FOI to the city of Hartford for their payroll and their pensions. Uh, we finally got the, pension, uh, the, the payroll. Astronomical. Astronomical when you look at the numbers. You look at a police officer who is making $60,000, but he walks away with a salary of $280,000 because of all that other money. No wonder, the st no wonder the Hartford is in such trouble. We don't have their pensions yet to look at that, and I'm sure those are going to be chokers. Um, New Haven, we got that too. Incredible, the dollars that these people are paid in those communities, and nobody cares. Why don't they care? The politicians don't have to tax their people. They just have to call up whoever's up at the Capitol, I need another truckload of money, send it on over, and it comes. It comes. It goes to Bridgeport, it goes to Waterbury, it goes to New Haven, it goes to Hartford and New London, it goes to all of those great places, and the rest of us, look where we are. I'm glad you have a friend up in Hartford, Mayor. I don't, but he ain't worth much. Good night. Good night. Tom. Tom Mazzarella, 600 Walcott Hill Road. If you remember back when the first quote came in for the high school screening, everybody up here kind of keeled over. I think it was mid-200s. not sure of the number, but I remember, Mayor, you were like, geez, that's a lot of money for a screening. What the heck is this thing about? So you tabled it and you got some more information. It turned out, yeah, there's a lot of engineering costs involved and so forth. I didn't think that was uh, a legitimate charge at the time. And my thought process was that we hired uh, Cuisenberry R. Carey to design this beautiful high school renovation. I remember seeing pictures and sketches of it. <coughs> I don't remember seeing any huge air conditioning units up on the top and I realized there was a change midstream with the geothermal versus the conventional heating system. Nevertheless, I think the architect should have been held responsible for some of that cost. They're the ones that came up with the plan. 
they're the ones that showed everybody how nice it was going to look and how well it was going to operate. And if there was a change midstream to change the heating system, I think they should have taken care of the change. Now we're three, four years down the road. Uh, you approve the design and the screening system for this $250,000 or whatever the number was. Um, Cuisenberry R. Carey, I would believe at this point, is probably more knowledgeable about the construction of that high school than anybody else. They had those ceilings out of that area that, where the screening is. They replaced the roof and all the design work that went along with all that, specking out all the products and various things. Now to come back and say, well, we didn't realize that the structural steel was smaller than it is and we had to redesign it and more time and delaying the contractors. Um, now we have to have, you know, rightfully so, you want to have somebody there and make sure it's done right. I don't disagree with that. I think all those costs need to be pushed back to Cuisenberry R. Carey. And I think you should have pushed some of the screening costs back to them. They're the ones that set the whole thing off. They, they didn't deliver a building that looked the way you thought it was going to look when you signed up. I don't know the exact process, but somewhere along the line, they came up with a design. I don't know if it was the high school renovation committee or the town manager or town attorney. Somebody had to sign something and say, yep, yeah, this is what we're getting. You know, is that what happened? Or did we get less than we were supposed to get? And now we're paying more. And, you know, it's not just that screening process. You recall the redesign of all the duct work in the swimming pool area. <laughs> Those guys aren't shy when they charge you for that stuff. You know, they're in there, they're doing work. You know, if they found asbestos and it had to be remediated, well, okay, fine. Now we got to pay this huge amount of money to redesign all the ductwork and everything. I think they should have had some, some liability as well. Well, I guess I'm wrong, Jeff. <laughs> but I'll be happy to talk to you after and tell, explain to you what happened. I would love to. Okay. Thanks. Absolutely. For the public comment. Okay. Seeing none, I'll entertain a motion to adjourn. Motion to adjourn. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 I was off by an hour.